boys and girls, welcome to Little Lamb Story Time. My name is, my name is Marie. And mine is Jillian. Avian. And our story today is called David, the Youngest Boy. You can find this story in the Bible in 1 Samuel, verse, I should say, chapter 16. But I'm reading it from my Bible friends. So let's start our story. Eight brothers standing in a row. The youngest boy at the end of the row is David. David and his brothers live on a farm near a small town. David was a shepherd boy. He took care of his father's sheep. To David's town came Samuel the prophet. The prophet invited all the people to a special feast. David's brothers were going to the feast. David's father was going to the feast. But the brother said to David, You are too young to go. You stay home with the sheep. Oh, that is not fair. That's not very nice. No. Yeah. David took his harp under his arm. He tuck his sling in his belt. He opened the gate to the sheep, sheep pen. Come, sheep, come, lambs, he called. The sheep follow David down the path. Black lamb and curly lamb walk on each side of David. Oh, that is so nice. Look at that. That's so cool. David led the sheep to a green grassy place. While the older sheep nibbled grass, black lamb and curly lamb play jumping games and bumping games with other lambs. David played tunes on his harp and kept close watch of the sheep. Oh, that's so cool. Black lamb began to wander away up over the hill. David put down his harp and ran after him. He brought black lamb back to the flock. Then David saw a wee that will make the sheep sick, sick if they eat it. He pulled up the weed and threw it away. A jackal Snick around a rock towards the sheep. Oh, David stamped his foot and the jackal ran. David took his sling from his belt. It was a long, long sling that his father had made for him from strong brown leather. He put a smooth stone in the sling. Now, what should he hit? That red rock? He will try. Around and around and around and around, he swung his sling. Zwing, went the stone. Bing, it hit the rock. David put another stone in his sling. He will aim for that round black hole in the tree. Around and around and around, he swung the sling. <sighs> and it went to the stone, straight into the round black hole in the tree. What a good aim. Look at that. He was good at that. He was good at that, huh? Then David heard a noise. It wasn't a humping noise, like a rabbit running through the grass. No, it wasn't a rabbit. It yeah. wasn't a pickling picking noise like a bird picking on a tree. No, it wasn't a bird. Look at that. Yeah. It was like a big animal prowling around. It was a bear. A fierce brown bear. And he was sneaking closer and closer and closer to where the lambs were playing. 
the bear creep up behind a bush, ready to snatch Curly Lamb as she ran by. <gasps> oh, no. Quickly, David put a stone in his sling. He ran straight towards the bear. Around and around and around, he, saw, he swung the sling like this. <sighs> and went the stone. It hit the fierce brown bear. The bear, what happened to the bear? He, he fell dead. Yay. David picked up frightening little curly lamb and carried her in his arm. Black lamb kept close by his side. Come, sheep. Come, lamb, called David and he led them to a place where they will be safe. While the older sheep nibbled the new green grass, black lamb and curly lamb again played jumping games with the other lambs, and David played tunes on his harp. Now, while David was watching the sheep, Samuel the prophet made ready the feast. David's father was at the feast. David's brothers were at the feast. Before they sat down to eat, the prophet said to David's father, have your boys walk before me one by one. Today, God will choose one of them for something very special. David's older brother walked before the prophet. No, it is not this boy, said the prophet. The next older boy walked before the prophet. No, it is not this boy, said the prophet. And then the next oldest brother walked before the prophet. The prophet shook his head and he said, No, no it is not this boy. One by one, David's brothers walked before the prophet. But each time the prophet said, no, it is not this boy. Then the prophet asked David's father, have you no other boys? Only the youngest boy. He is tending the sheep. Send and get him, said the prophet. David came running, his harp under his arm, his sling and his belt. His cheeks were red. The wind blew his hair. Walk before the prophet, David, said his father. And where's the lamb? The lambs are in the pastures, eating. David walked before the prophet. This is the one, said the prophet. This is the boy God chose. The prophet poured sweet-smelling oil on David's head to show that he was the chosen one. Now, we shall sit down to the feast, said the prophet. A place was made for David, and he sat with his father and brothers. Why had David been chosen? What will he do? No one knew. It was a secret. Wow, it was a secret. David's father didn't know. David's brother didn't know. David didn't know. Only the prophet and God knew that someday David will be king. Oh, and David will be as good a king as he was a shepherd boy. Well, boys and girls, this is the end of our story. What do you think about that story? What do you think about this story? It's really great. How about you? You like the story? Really great. It's really great. You know, boys and girls, David was a little boy. He was a small. But yeah, God chose him to be, you know, a king. For God, it, there's nothing, huh? There's nothing too small or too big. When God has a plan for each one of us, He'll do it. And He will be right there with us. 
So will you please bow your heads with me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful story of David and how you chose him to be a king for you. We know that there's nothing too big or too small for you to fulfill. So help us to trust you. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Boys and girls, we'll wait for you next time. Bye. Hello boys and girls, welcome to Little Lamb Story Time. My name is Marie. And my name is Jillian. And today we have a special friend. His name is Nacho. He's sort of getting ready to listen to the story. Our story today is from my Bible friends and it's called Joash the Boy King. Don't cry little Joash. Don't cry. Someday you will be a king and wear a crown on your head and sit on a golden throne. But if the wicked queen hears you cry, she will send her soldiers to take you away. And then you won't be a king and wear a crown on your head and sit on a golden throne. Uncle Jehoiada, who was a priest in the temple, and Aunt Yoshiba, kept baby Josh in the bedroom of their temple room. Joash learned to walk. He learned to talk. The wicked queen did not find him. The boy Joash grew. Each birthday, he stood a little taller beside the bedroom door's post. In the daytime, the door was always buried shut, lest someone in the temple see him and go tell the wicked queen. In the evening, when, she, when the people had gone home, the door was unbarred and Joash could walk with his uncle in the temple court. One evening, as Joash and Uncle Jehoiada walked together in the temple court, Joash saw a hole in the temple wall. Then he said, then he saw another one and another. Why the temple walls were full of holes? The holes were made by the wicked queen's sons when they tore away parts of the walls to build a temple for their idols, said Uncle Jehoiada. To repair the holes will cost a lot of money, and there is no money in the temple treasury. Uncle Jehoiada taught Joash to read the law of God. Joash read, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not steal. Joash loved to read the law of God. He loved God. Then came the day that Joash was seven. Uncle Jehoiada took him by the hand, led him out in the temple porch, and stood him beside the bronze pillar. Below the porch, to one side, were singers, on the other, trumpeters with silver trumpets. Roads of soldiers with spears guarded the porch. Many people were in the temple court. Quietly, they watched and wait. Uncle Jehoiada placed a scroll of the law in Joash's hand and the king's crown upon his head. Then, with a horn of sweet-smelling oil, 
he anointed Joash, king of Judea. The trumpeters blew their silver trumpets. The singers sung songs of praise. The people clapped their hands and shouted, God save the king! God save the king! The wicked queen came running into the temple court. She had heard the trumpets and singing. When she saw the boy king standing beside the pillar, she tore her clothes and shouted, Treason! Treason! She commanded the soldiers to take the boy away, but the soldiers took her away instead. <laughs> she didn't expect that. The people lined up in a long procession, soldiers, singers, and priests. The trumpeters led the way out of the temple gate and down the street to the king's palace. They carried the boy king, Joash. This palace will now be his home. Slowly, Joash walked up the palace aisle. He climbed the steps to the golden throne. The throne was very large, and his feet did not reach the floor. But he sat as straight as a king. Again, the trumpeters blew their trumpets. The singers sang, and the people shouted, God save the king! God save the king. To be king was a big task for a boy. He will need Uncle Jehoiada's help for many years. King Joash remembered the holes in the temple wall. How could he get the money to mend them? He sent men throughout the land to collect coins, but the men spent the coins on their own houses. The holes in the temple walls were still there. Then Joash thought of a different plan to raise money. Joash asked Uncle Jehoiada for a chest with a lid. Let us put the chest beside the temple gate, he said. The chest was placed beside the gate. Let us cut a hole in the, in the lid, said Joash. A hole? just large enough for coins to go through. The hole was caught in the lid. Now, when people come to the temple to worship, they will see the chest and drop coins through the hole in its lid. People came from near and far to see the king's money chest. Boys and girls came, fathers and mothers, grandfathers and grandmothers. They marched by and dropped coins into the chest. At first, the coins made a clinkety, clunk, clinkety sound. When the chest was half full, clunkety, clunk, clunk. And when it was almost full, just clunk. <laughs> Bring the chest to the treasury room, said Joash. In the treasury room, his helpers poured the coins into bags. The chest was again placed at the temple gate, and the coins went clinkety, clink, clink, clonkety, clonk, clonk. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds funny. <laughs> and then clunk. <laughs> again and again, the chest was filled and empty into bags in the treasury until there was money enough to repair the holes in the temple walls. That was funny. Stone cutters cut stones. Carpenters saw boards. Carefully they worked, for this was God's house. Alas, the hole in the temple walls were repaired. Now, many people came to worship in the temple. They learned to love God just like Joash the king. God looked down from heaven and was pleased to see the beautiful temple, the worshiping people, and the young king on the golden throne. Well, boys and girls, that is the end of our story for today. What a story. Being a king, such a young, 
a young age, I don't know. You think you could have done that? I think the only way we could do that is by God giving us wisdom, right? Yeah. I mean, he, he was a special boy, and God gave him a lot of wisdom. And God has a special plan for each one of us, and he can give us wisdom if we ask. Well, boys and girls, with this, I will ask if you will join us for a prayer. Please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful story and how this little boy became keen to serve you. Father Lord, you have a special plan for each one of us. Help us to serve you in the best way we can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Welcome to another episode of This Week with God. Hi there friends. Welcome to This Week with God, a weekly program aired every Sunday on different media platforms. This program is targeted so that young people like you and me may get to know Christ as our personal Savior. So welcome to another episode. Never too young. Today's episode is really relevant for us as young people because today we'll be talking about leadership. At this age? No, that's not me, you may say. But that's exactly why we'll be talking about it today. Because it really doesn't matter your age, height, weight, or beauty level, if you could put it that way. You'll agree with me by the end of this episode. Now go with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. How beautiful. And you know, these words were not only spoken to Jeremiah, they are being spoken to us even now because they are written in the Bible. And if they're in the Bible, that means they were also meant for us. Now listen to what Jeremiah replied to the Lord. Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. I think I've heard that excuse before. In fact, I've come up to the Lord with the same excuse. Now, I'm going to get a little bit personal here. I started preaching since the age of four, I'm 15, and um, you know, I would preach, but I was still a little kid. So when I realized the responsibility that lies on the one that stands behind that podium, I felt the same way Jeremiah felt. I did not feel qualified, I did not feel old enough to take that responsibility and other ones that the Lord was putting on my shoulders. Yet this is the response the Lord gave me, gave Jeremiah, and is giving you right now if you feel the same way as Jeremiah did. Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Well, you can't, or at least you shouldn't, reply back to God with a response like this. But God did not stop there. He went on to say this, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms, to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. This is leadership. This is a great responsibility. Because when God calls, He supplies you with all the strength and wisdom and knowledge that you'll need to accomplish His will. And guess what? He also supplies you with the right words to say. The hard part is what He said in verse 8. 
Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you. You see, when we do God's will, life will not always be easy and smooth. There will be rough times, but God's promises do not fail. In fact, look at what he says in the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3. For I am the Lord, I do not change. So there we have it, said by God himself. He does not change. His promises are faithful and true. And he promised us that he would be there to deliver us, that he would never leave us nor forsake us, that he would bless those who would bless us and curse those who would curse us. But the reason why we don't see these promises being fulfilled in our lives is because we haven't fulfilled the task that has been given us to do. There was another man that also put excuses before God when he was called into a position of leadership, Moses. After Moses fulfilled his first 12 years in his Hebrew home, he went to spend the rest of his years in Pharaoh's palace until one day. As he was passing by one of the places where the Hebrew slaves worked, he saw an Egyptian soldier beating a Hebrew pretty hard. So he decided to take action and save his Hebrew brother, so he killed the Egyptian and buried him there in the sand. But then word spread out and got to Pharaoh's ears. But before he could be caught, he left Egypt and fled to the land of Midian at the age of 40. Now, 40 years passed. He got married, had two sons, and one day, as he was taking care of his father-in-law's sheep, he saw a burning bush. But it did not get consumed. So he went to see. And then, as he got closer, he heard his name being called out of the bush. And then he realized that it was God in the bush speaking to him and calling him to deliver his people that had been in bondage for hundreds of years. Yet, he put excuses of his reputation as a person, and God would give him an answer about what was he supposed to say, and God would give him an answer. About if they would believe him or not, and God would give him an answer. That it was love of tongue and speech, and God would give him an answer. And finally he tells God to send someone else, and then God's anger was kindled against him, and then he said, What about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if you were your mouth and as if you were God to him. Wow! God had already provided Moses of his brother, and he was on his way to meet him. Yet he was putting excuses that proved that he did not trust God enough, believe God enough to know that his promises were true. And he was 80. So your age really doesn't matter. What matters is your willingness to serve the Lord. With these words, I'd like to finish up with a couple of points. Number one, when God calls, He qualifies. No matter how unqualified we might feel for whatever reason, God's promises are faithful and true. God never changes. His word is immutable and His love is eternal. Number two, as I've said in previous episodes, life is tough on God's front lines, but it's worth it. In fact, when we get to heaven, we'll remember all our trials and temptations and all those things that we thought were the big deal here on earth. And we'll say, oh, heaven was cheap enough. Heaven was cheap enough. So let's face the trials placed in our lives for our character building with gladness. And as the Apostle James wrote, let's count it all joy when we see ourselves in these situations. For you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. No matter how old, no matter how young. Someday we will meet Jesus face to face and then we can get all the details. See you there.
Faith without works is dead. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw an eye to God and he will draw an eye to you. Now, those are famous quotes. Do you know where they come from? The book of James in the New Testament. In fact, this five chapter book has quite a few well-known quotes. Do you know this one? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. James 1, 5. And here is another promise. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. James 1, verse 12. Allow me one more. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. James 1, 27. What a clear and simple definition. Who is this writer of great quotes? James, yes. But which James? Unfortunately, there isn't enough evidence in the book to come to any firm conclusion. The name James was very, very common among Jews because it is the Greek equivalent of the name Jacob. Jacob later renamed Israel, the father of the 12 tribes. There were two of Jesus' 12 disciples named James, James the son of Zebedee and James the son of Alphaeus. And there was James the brother of Jesus to name three. James the son of Zebedee was martyred about the year uh, AD 44 and James, the son of Alphaeus, was not a prominent disciple. So it seems unlikely that either of these two wrote the epistle of James. James, the brother of Jesus, however, seems to be more likely the author of this epistle. He is believed to have been the leader in Jerusalem and to have presided at the council of the church at Jerusalem. The tone of the introduction in chapter 1, verse 1, implies that the writer is well known to those he addresses because he speaks with recognized authority. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. James 1, verse 1. James, the brother of Jesus, was martyred by stoning in or before the year A.D. 62, not long before the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. During that time period, the Jews were becoming more and more frustrated with the injustice and corruption of the Roman rule. The book of James addresses these frustrations in a Christian way and adds weight to the argument that James, the brother of Jesus, was the one who wrote the book. The epistle is addressed to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, making it a general letter to the early Christian church. There are seven books grouped together in the Bible that are considered general epistles. James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, and Jude. These are placed after Paul's epistles in the Bible. The epistle of James addresses many of the same issues in the early Christian church that Paul and Peter wrote about. Do these same issues appear in our churches today? Is this book of James relevant to your issues and my issues? Well, have you heard people discussing the relationship between faith and works? <laughs> I suspect you have. James 2 verses 14 through 26 includes that famous quote we started with about how faith without work is dead. I 
Are you always careful and in full control of what you say? You might want to hear what James has to say about controlling the tongue in chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. <laughs> Do you need wisdom? Did you claim that promises for wisdom that we read at the beginning? This is the type of wisdom you can expect to come from God. James 3, 17 states, but the wisdom that is from above is pure first, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be treated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. I think this book is really, really, really and very relevant for our day. In fact, the book of James is packed, packed with relevant instruction. Here are some more. Do you know anyone who favors the rich kids and leaves out the poor kids? James have a few things to say in chapter 2 verses 1 to 13 about those who are partial in this way. Do you ever find yourself torn between some worldly pleasure and single-minded devotion to God? James 4.8 refers to this condition as double-minded and calls you on to purify your heart. Do you wonder if you really need to keep that fourth commandment about the seventh day Sabbath? James 2 verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Do you ever recognize a good thing to do, but neglect it? Maybe procrastinate until it's too late? James 4 17 says, Therefore to him, that knoweth to do good, and doeth not, to him it is sin. Is this book relevant? Absolutely! To close, let me give you one last quote from James. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Keep praying. Remember, keep praying. Amen. Jesus, the anchor of the soul. What is an anchor? What is it for? It is a heavy hook that is thrown into the water with a chain to give stability to a boat in an unstable environment such as the sea. This is a good illustration that the Apostle Paul uses to show that just as we are unstable in our emotions and feelings, God places in Jesus through His Spirit an anchor that produces stability in our lives. Oh, whoa, whoa. It breaks my soul to think of those who discard the anchor of their faith to harden their hearts, their hearts and lose eternal life. We have to study this sad reality in this lesson because the Apostle Paul does not spare words when he warns about this problem. It is wonderful to know that when we are converted to the Lord, God puts his seal on our conscience and our soul to keep us steadfast in the faith. If we hold that firmness, to the end, God will not let us go. 
But in choosing between a life of faith or self-denial, many prefer to yield to carnal appetites and the anchor and the anchor of faith and hope that God placed in them by His Spirit is taken from their souls. In other instances, the problems of life, the bitterness that sticks to the soul, harden the heart of many until they become unable to rejoice in the truths of the gospel. The apostle warned, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Hebrews 12 verse 15. I have encountered in my ministry people who were treated unfairly by the church and their hearts became soiled, hardening in such a way that from a human perspective it would seem impossible to bring them back. They did not turn away because of other beliefs, but because they ended up passing on to them what the Apostle Paul said when talking about their struggles. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7, 19. Only through the intervention of the Holy Spirit and in response to prayer can a person be delivered from Satan's clutches in such circumstances. Some, by divine mercy and the prayers of others, have been able to return. But others, and I fear it is most of them, hardened their hearts until the end of their days. What a sadness, what a sadness that so many lose eternal life, an eternally happy life for a wounded pride or so many other reasons. Once a young woman jumped for joy in Santo Domingo in Dominican Republic. When I was going to give my last message in the afternoon at the end of two weeks, she told me that her dad had become bitter and left the church for 19 years. She asked him, on that Sabbath morning, to at least listen to my last message on the radio. When she returned home, her father was crying. He said to his daughter, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. Her daughter, crying now with joy, told me he came to be baptized and to ask God for forgiveness for having been away for so long a time. After giving my last message in Coatzacoalcos, southern Mexico, a chubby sister came, bringing her husband as chubby as she was. She practically elbowed her way, and she told me, Pastor, my husband left the church 21 years ago. And today I was able to bring him to listen to your message. What words can you tell him now? I looked at him and he with a smile told him, don't be rebellious to the heavenly vision. If God touched your heart today, don't harden it again. And I was about to greet another people I added, I will seek you in the kingdom of heaven. Don't let us down. I won't, he decidedly replied. But why does the apostle Paul say that those who turn away after partaking of heavenly realities and being fully converted cannot return? Let us read some passages. It is impossible... I repeat, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have 
tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen, fallen away to be brought back to repentance. Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6. The first step required to convert to the gospel is self-denial, so that Christ can take control of one's life. Many things that we once loved of the world must be sacrificed on the cross of Christ in order to start a new life in Christ and learn to take spiritual things instead. But if after having tasted these spiritual goods, we renounce them and return in Peter's word like dogs to the vomit of the world, there is no other solution. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, said the Apostle Paul later in his epistle, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony or, of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10 verses 26 to 31. Yes, through the prayers of others, a person who fell into the deception of the world and harden his heart can be restored. But Paul is saying that outside of Christ's sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, there is no salvation. It is impossible to obtain redemption. Salvation is found in no one else, wrote Paul in Acts 4 verse 12, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. In Hebrews, the Apostle Paul is speaking of sin against the Holy Spirit, the only person in the universe who has power to touch the heart and transform it so we can live among the angels of God. And if the Holy Spirit is rejected, God forces no one. He eventually retreats, and it is impossible to be regenerated again. The hardest battle is against self, against a pride which resists being humbled before God. Where then is boasting, as the Apostle Paul in Romans 3 verse 27, and he responds, it is excluded from the gospel and replaced by a life of faith. I, unlike Saul, who had no sexual entanglements, David experienced forgiveness because he humbled himself before God, even though as king he possessed the same full power of the boastful kings of that time. We may read his sincere repentance in Psalm 32 and chapter also 51, or of Psalm 51. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you, said the Lord to the proud Pharisees in Matthew 21, verse 31. Not for the sins they committed, but because they were not self-righteous before men and were closer to appreciating and receiving the grace and forgiveness of God. It is pride that God detests most about human beings. For this reason, if the person who was converted and came to delight in the good things to come 
and receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit turns back, there is nothing else that can be done for him. This was well grasped by King David when he fell into sin. He caught the danger of hardening the heart and driving away the Holy Spirit. This is the reason why he cried out to God saying, Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Psalm 51, verse 11. When one of Benito Mussolini's mistresses saw through the window how the people cheered the fascist dictator and how the Duce, as uh, he was called in Italy, enjoyed that praise of the people, he said, stup she said, stupefied, this is the beginning of the end. And she fled to Argentina. She was not wrong because the Duch died with another mistress shortly afterwards, outraged and hated by the people. We read the same in the Bible of many kings and emperors and their people. Why will this world remain desolate? Because of pride. The Apostle Paul warned that at the end of the world, the arrogant and haughty in heart would be multiplied. 2 Timothy 3 verse 2, and we can read also Romans 1 verse 30. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes, according to John, not from the Father, but from the world. 1 John 2, verse 16. And we may read something similar in Matthew 7, verse 22. The wicked boast and reviles the eternal. In his pride, the wicked man does not see him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. Psalm 10, verse 3 and 4. For this reason, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble. James 4, 6, 1 Peter 5, 1. Many could pretend to believe in God, but they mock God with their behavior. This is why Solomon warned that it is better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Proverbs 16, verse 19. At the end of the world, the eyes of the arrogant will be humbled and human pride brought low. The eternal alone will be exalted in that day. The eternal Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that are exalted, and they will be humbled. Isaiah 2, verses 11 and 12. Along the same line of warning, Ellen G. White wrote, The most hopeless, the most incurable of all sins is pride, self-sufficiency. There is nothing so offensive to God or so dangerous to the human soul as pride and self-sufficiency. Of all sins, it is the most hopeless, the most incurable. Let us conclude on a positive note. If we cultivate the tastes of heaven by reading the word of God and dreaming of the realities of the world to come, we can taste in advance, according to Hebrews 6, something of those future blessings and delight in them. As we saw in commenting on another lesson, Jesus does not yet sit on David's throne. He will do that once he finishes his mediation before the throne of God in his temple. 
but it is our privilege to enjoy in advance by faith that future moment so near to us today when we will be able to sit with him on his throne since we are all called to be kings together with him. We are unstable. We know it. But God is stable. We cannot swear because we do not have all power in heaven and earth to fulfill our oaths. But God can swear, and he did. He will keep his covenant of salvation standing and fix it or seal it in our hearts as an anchor that cannot move until his coming. So be it in each of us. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you to request you to put Jesus as an anchor in our soul, to be stable in our religious experience, to keep our faith alive permanent, to be sealed by your Spirit in order uh, to trust in your guidance until the, until the end. May we overcome with the power of Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
que está en el frasco pueda ser un árbol bueno para todos los demás. Oh, Ahora, palo. este es un verso de la Biblia que Jesús nos quiere compartir y por eso lo escribió allí. ¿Qué crees que dice el verso, Caleb? Dice lo siguiente, fíate en el Señor de todo tu corazón y no te apoyes en tu propia prudencia. Conócelo en todos tus caminos y Él enderezará tus veredas. ¿Saben qué quiere decir ese verso? Fíjate en el Señor quiere decir que tengas confianza en Él. Y si lo hacemos de todo corazón, quiere decir que no vamos a ser buenos unos días y malos otros días, ¿verdad? No, vamos a ser buenos siempre porque va a ser de todo corazón, ¿verdad? ¿Dónde está tu corazón? Está aquí, ¿verdad? Pero también tiene que ver con lo que pensamos. Y el último parte del verso aquí en Proverbios dice lo siguiente. Reconócelo en todos tus caminos. Y eso quiere decir que todo lo que hagamos vamos a ver que todo lo que hagamos sea lo que Dios quiere y no que nada más lo que nos dé ganas de hacer, ¿verdad? Porque al fin Jesús tiene toda la razón y sabe lo mejor para nosotros. ¿Les gustó el relato? ¿Quieren hacer una semilla para Jesús? ¿Una planta, un árbol bueno cuando sean grandes y tenga fruto rico? Eso va a ser tu carácter. Y espero que todos ustedes pueden llegar al cielo como Jesús desea también. Y para eso necesitamos todos ser muy buenos. Bueno, este es el relato del día de hoy. Espero que hayan aprendido algo y que todos ustedes, niños de la audiencia, pueden hacer una semilla de bondad para todos. Esa es la historia de hoy.
morning, happy Sabbath. Buenos días, un feliz sábado. Here in here in Latin America, we wave a lot, don't we? Y aquí en Latinoamérica nos saludamos todos. Instead of clapping like some people do, we wave when we say thank you and hello. Así, hay personas que nos aplauden, pero nosotros no. Nosotros sencillamente saludamos a todos. We are a very physical people. Somos los hispanos, somos personas bastante físicas. When I was in Australia, we had the whole camp meeting and we came to Sabbath evening sundown. Ahora, cuando nosotros estuvimos en Australia, tuvimos todo el, el, el campamento que tuvimos allí y llegó el momento ya de sábado en la noche. And so I said, do you have a special song that you sing whenever you, whenever you uh, say goodbye to the Sabbath? Y yo en este momento pregunté, ¿tienen ustedes algo especial, algún himno, algún cántico para cerrar el sábado? No, they said, we don't have something special in English. Y ellos dijeron, no, no tenemos nada especial para cerrar el sábado. Okay, then I want to invite all of the Spanish people, many people from Chile and other countries, come up front to the pulpit. Entonces yo dije, bueno, yo voy a invitar entonces a los hispanos. Y estaban allí varios hermanos de Chile, de otros países hispanos, y los invité a venir al púlpito. Nearly 100 came forward. Casi 100 personas, casi 100 hermanos se acercaron. And we sang Día Santo del Señor, which is the Spanish song to say goodbye to this happening. Y allí entonces entonamos el himno Día Santo del Señor. Es un himno que usamos para cerrar el sábado, ¿verdad? They enjoyed it very much. Y a ellos les encantó. But they were not ready for what followed. Pero a ellos por su, ellos por supuesto eso les gustó, pero no estaban listos para lo que siguió el himno. Because afterward it's feliz semana, feliz semana. <laughs> Porque después del himno todo el mundo se abraza, feliz semana. Gave everybody all the ladies a kiss on the cheek and and a big hug to all the men. Y a todas las damas se les dio su beso en su mejilla. Y los caballeros se abrazaban con entusiasmo. They were very surprised to know that there was a very special way to say goodbye to the beautiful Sabbath. Y para en Austra a los australianos le pareció algo fantástico que había una forma tan especial para cerrar el sábado y dar la bienvenida a otra semana. Well, I want to give you all a big welcome to this beautiful Sabbath day. Así que yo quiero darle todos una gran bienvenida a este hermoso día sábado. What a beautiful day Sabbath is. Qué día tan hermoso es el sábado. We had a senior pastor in one of, in the church that I went to when I was young in the States. Una vez tuvimos un pastor que en una de las iglesias en Estados Unidos cuando yo estaba pequeño He, he was invited to an evangelical event and as an Adventist pastor, he went to be with them. Él fue invitado para un evento evangélico y él fue invitado representando a la iglesia. And they asked him a question in front of everybody. Y a él le hicieron una pregunta delante de todo el mundo. Pastor, uh, how can we Sunday keepers enjoy the Sabbath so much as you enjoy the seventh day? Y a él le preguntaron, Pastor, ¿Cómo nosotros, quienes eh, asistimos a la iglesia el domingo, podemos disfrutar tanto el, el día de reposo como ustedes disfrutan el sábado? Friday night you get together with your families and you have a special worship and a special meal. El viernes de noche usted se reúne con su familia, tiene una cena especial. You welcome the Sabbath hours for 24 hours, it's a special day. Y le dan la bienvenida el día sábado como un día especial. 24 horas. But for Sunday keepers, we just go to church and it's a normal rest of the week. Pero para aquellos que nos vamos el domingo a la iglesia, sencillamente vamos unas pocas horas y ya el resto de la semana, pues, bueno, es igual. El resto del día es como otro día más. How can we enjoy? How can we make Sunday so special, like the whole 24 hours of the seventh day? Así, ¿cómo nosotros podríamos entonces disfrutar el domingo, si esas 24 horas? Como ustedes disfrutan el séptimo día. The pastor said it's very easy. Y el pastor dijo, es muy fácil. Just move everything forward 24 hours. Sencillamente, mueve todo 24 horas para, para hacerlo después. If you worship on a day that God made, everything changes. Y si usted adora en el día que Dios dio todo lo todo, que Dios hizo, entonces todo lo demás va a tener lugar. God sanctified the seventh day alone. Dios solo santificó el séptimo día. Not the first day, not the two, three, four, five, six. 
No el primer día de la semana, ni el segundo, ni el cuarto, ni el quinto. The seventh day. El séptimo día. And there's a special blessing attached to being in God's presence those 24 hours. Y hay una bendición especial que está anexa a esa bendición de Dios, a esa eh, creación de Dios del día de reposo, el séptimo día. So we want to welcome all of you that are joining us from the other side of the world. Some of you are watching live at midnight. Ahora, queremos también dar la bienvenida a algunos de ustedes quienes se encuentran en, al otro lado del mundo. Algunos de ustedes están viendo esto en vivo y es medianoche. And in Europe, and in Africa. También queremos enviar nuestros saludos a Europa, a África. Central America, Caribbean. América Central, al Caribe. North America. A Norteamérica. And of course we don't want to forget Asia because they are watching and they transmit some of our programs as well. Y tampoco queremos dejar de lado a nuestros hermanos en Asia. Ellos no solamente transmiten parte de nuestros programas, sino que también lo 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 ven y lo reproducen allí. I, I won't mention Antarctica because I don't know what the penguins are doing today. Ahora no voy a decir la Antártida porque no sé qué están haciendo los pingüinos hoy. But I know there's always people on Antarctica too. Pero yo sé que allí hay gente también. All, many countries have teams of people studying the Antarctica and they live on that continent. De hecho, hay varios países que tienen grupos de personas que viven allí y estudian esa área geográfica. And today we're going to talk about our inheritance as a human race, as humans, our families. Ahora, hoy vamos a hablar sobre nuestra herencia. Nuestra herencia como familia humana, como raza humana. It's very interesting what God has prepared for us. Y es algo muy interesante lo que Dios ha preparado para nosotros. So, the, our title is, for today's sermon is, Our Inheritance. Así que el título del sermón de hoy, Nuestra Herencia. Let us start with a word of prayer. Vamos a comenzar con una palabra de oración. Our loving Heavenly Father and Creator. Nuestro querido Padre Celestial, nuestro Creador. Thank you for creating us in your image. Gracias por hacernos a tu imagen. Thank you for giving us not only life, but redeeming us and giving us a, a chance once again at eternal life. Gracias no solamente por redimirnos, sino también para darnos una oportunidad para tener vida eterna. Thank you for giving your son for us. Gracias por dar tu hijo a nosotros. And dear Jesus, thank you for joining the human race and adopting us as your brothers. Y Señor Jesús, gracias por venir a esta familia humana y por estimarnos como tus hermanos. We love you and we thank you. Te amamos y te agradecemos esto. Please speak to us through your Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts and minds. Por favor, Señor, habla a nosotros a través de tu Santo Espíritu que él llene nuestras mentes y corazones. And make us more and more into your image. Y haznos más de acuerdo a tu imagen. Like you did originally, restore us. Y que Señor, tú puedas restaurarnos. We pray for that and we thank you in the name of all powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Y Señor, oramos por esto y te agradecemos en el nombre todopoderoso de Jesús. Amén. Amen. I was getting ready to come up here. Today. Yo estaba alistándome para venir. And I was looking at my hands. Y ahora estoy observando mis manos. They're all rough. Y están bastante ásperas. And the back of the hands are all tanned with the sun. Y la parte en vez de mi mano está todo quemado por el sol. We've been working outside and I've been on the tractor for weeks y preparing hemos, everything. Hemos estado trabajando por semanas, he estado trabajando en el tractor. And, and I want to thank all our volunteers for all the hard work. Things are going forward rapidly. Y quiero agradecer a todo el equipo porque el trabajo está avanzando rápidamente, así que quiero agradecerles. In, Nor in North America and Northern Europe and Asia, it is cold. En el norte, en Norteamérica, también en Europa y en Asia, actualmente es frío. But it's getting warmer. Pero se está calentando. Here in South America, south of the equator. Ahora nosotros que nos encontramos en Sudamérica, que estamos al sur del Ecuador, it's getting colder. Está también eh, llegando a disminuir la temperatura. And we want everybody to have a place to be in 
When it gets cold, that we want them to have their house finished. Y nosotros queremos que ya cuando llegue el invierno, que se pone más frío, ya tengamos el lugar donde acomodar a, a las personas. This reminds me that a lot of people have contacted me. Y esto me trae acuerdo que hay muchas personas quienes me han contactado from all over the world. De diferentes partes del mundo. We want to come live with you on the mountain. Eh, nosotros queremos ir y vivir con usted On the mountain. en las montañas. Uh, there's not enough room for everybody. Bueno, la verdad es que no hay lugar para todos. We don't want an ant hill where everybody lives within a yard of the other person. Y nosotros <laughs> no queremos una situación en la donde una persona viva al lado de otra. Uh, if you want to have friendly neighbors and work nicely, you have to give enough space to the family. Y si usted quiere tener buenos vecinos y quiere trabajar bien, usted tiene que tener espacio entre vecinos. You can't be crowd everybody up. Usted no puede amontonar a las personas. So what, what, what to do for those people? Entonces, ¿qué hacer con esas personas? Some people say, I want a few hectares. Some say, I just want one hectare. Hay gente que dice, bueno, yo quiero unas pocas hectáreas, yo quiero una hectárea. Some want more. Hay personas que quieren más. So what we decided to do was to proceed with the purchase since there are no small properties. Y de lo que nosotros hemos pensado es entonces eh, proceder con la compra de una propiedad. Some people sent me some money to help find the property for them. Y algunas personas me han enviado un dinero para encontrar una propiedad para ellos. And I have done my best and we found a property. Y he tratado entonces de, de buscar lo mejor que pueda y hemos encontrado algo. Not too far from where we live. No muy lejos de donde nos encontramos. It's about 46 hectares. Es aproximadamente unas 46 hectáreas. It has some mountain. Que tiene parte de ellos montañoso. Some precipices. Algunos eh, tiene precipicio. Water runs along the edge of the property. Y hay agua que corre a lo largo de la propiedad. Good soil. Es una buena tierra. And there's, there's enough for quite a few people to have their little plot of land. Y es suficiente para que algunas pocas personas puedan tener un terrenito. So already two people have already sent money in, and, and we started the purchase and there is, there is some availability for people who would like to have a piece of that. Así que eh, ya hay dos personas quienes han enviado algo para la compra de esto y hay algo disponible para algunas personas. And, and not forgetting that in Mexico there is a few hectares still available as well. También en México para las personas que viven allá hay un proyecto que tiene más o menos estas mismas características. So welcome to all of you and may God guide and lead you in all of your decisions as we accelerate toward the coming of Jesus Christ. Así que todos sean bienvenidos y que el Señor pueda guiar las decisiones y en sus vidas mientras aceleramos a la pronta venida del Señor. I like having good neighbors, so if you're a good neighbor, welcome. <laughs> Yo, eh, a mí me gusta tener buenos vecinos, así que usted es un vecino bueno, está bien. We can help each other. Podemos ayudarnos unos a otros. Some of you are specialists in some areas, others have talents and skills in other areas. Hay algunos de ustedes que son especialistas en alguna área, otros son especialistas en otro. Everybody at conception inherits certain characteristics. Ahora, cada persona eh, durante su concepción hereda ciertas características. We have the biological characteristics. Tenemos características biológicas. Like race, como, color, your size. Como por ejemplo su tamaño, su color. Your race. Su raza. All of us have some kind of race. Algunos de nosotros tenemos algún tipo de raza. We all have a certain size. Algunos de nosotros tenemos cierto tamaño. Some of us have added to our size with age. Y con el paso del tiempo añadimos el tamaño. And some of us decrease in size according to our age. Mientras que hay otros quienes avanzamos en año y vamos eh, disminuyendo la talla. Let's look at some of the people around the world and see how creative the Creator is in giving us different sizes and races. And Ahora vamos a ver alguna parte de el colorido y de la variedad de creación de Dios en personas, tanto en tamaño. Here's some little girls from the mountains razas. of the Philippines. Aquí vemos unas pequeñas niñas. De las montañas de las Filipinas. Here's one from the Muslim countries. Aquí vemos a un caballero de países islámicos. There we have somebody from 
the South Pacific. Aquí vemos a un, a un hombre del Pacífico Sur. See, they're all different. Y todos son distintos. Mongolia. De Mongolia. Interesting, beautiful people. Es, hay gente que es interesante, hermosa. Uh, we have some little girls from India. Aquí vemos a unas niñitas de la India. Uh, an indigenous man from Mexico. Aquí tenemos a un hombre indígena de México. I worked with that tribe when I was there. Y yo, de hecho, trabajé con esta tribu mientras vivía en México. There we have an, a North American native Indian. Aquí tenemos a una nativa de los Estados Unidos. Beautiful people of all sizes and colors. Gente hermosa de todos tamaños y colores. Here is a, a Latin American lady, very Aquí beautiful. Aquí vemos a una hermosa mujer hispana latina. Here we have somebody from Papua New Guinea. Aquí vemos a alguien de Papua Nueva Guinea. And somehow we skipped a slide. There is a, a lady from North America. Y luego del otro lado vemos una dama de Norteamérica. And there we have a Chinese man. Y luego vemos ahí a un chino. All have cultures, biological traits, uh, traditions, and languages. Todos tienen sus tradiciones, sus lenguas, sus características biológicas distintas, sus culturas. All of them make up the beauty of the human race that God has made. Y todos ellos conforman la belleza de la raza humana que Dios ha creado. Each person has talents, skills, strengths, and weaknesses. Cada persona tiene talentos, tiene habilidades, tiene fortalezas y también debilidades. Some of us inherited certain talents and skills, but like our musicians, and they develop them through practice even more. Algunos de nosotros, por ejemplo, heredamos algunos talentos, algunas habilidades, pero que a través de la práctica, por ejemplo, con los músicos, llegan a desarrollar aún más. Some persons inherit or may, through business aptitudes, develop resources and acquire resources. Por ejemplo, hay personas también que heredan cierta aptitud para los negocios y ellos pueden desarrollar negocios y tener recursos. Some people inherit a lot of money just hay, without doing anything. Hay personas que heredan mucho dinero sin haber hecho nada. Some families are united to their inheritance while others fight like cats and dogs and they're separated by their inheritance. Hay familias quienes se unen a través de esa herencia mientras que hay otras que pelean como gatos y perros por la herencia. <laughs> Some, some fight, steal, and even kill. Algunos roban, algunos eh, mienten, algunos incluso matan. Not just rich families, even poor families fight over resources. Y no solamente familias ricas, hay familias pobres también que pelean por recursos. I was invited by a brother of the church in Brazil, the, the wealthiest Adventist uh, that we know in Brazil. Yo fui invitado en una ocasión por un hermano eh, que pertenece a una de las familias eh, más eh, ricas de Brasil. Um, a church member. Uno del miembro de iglesia. And he wanted to, he invited me and he wanted me to spend the weekend with him. I thought, I thought we were going to go to his house. Y él me invitó para que pasáramos el fin de semana. Eh, yo pensé que íbamos a ir a su casa. He had heard about the purchase of the Red Adveneer Television Network. Y él había escuchado sobre la compra de esta televisora de la red Advenir. He wanted to know more about it. Y él quería saber más de, sobre esto. I knew that he was a multimillionaire with nearly a, a billion dollars. Y yo sabía que él era un multimillonario. Él tiene unos recursos que sobrepasan mil, el billón de dólares. Mil, mil, mil millones. millones. And so. I decided maybe he's going to help. Y yo pensé, bueno, quizás él va a ayudar. We had not paid for it yet. Porque aún no habíamos cancelado la cuenta. So when I was in Manaus in Brazil, I flew across to Rio de Janeiro. Así que cuando estaba en Manaus en esa ocasión, volé hasta Rio de Janeiro. He picked me up in his car. Y él me recogió en su vehículo. 
I noticed the windows were very, very thick glass. Y yo me di cuenta que las ventanas de su auto eran de un vidrio, pero bien grueso. And I said, are these bulletproof? Y yo le pregunté, ¿estos son a prueba de balas? Oh, yes. He said, all the car is bulletproof. Even if they fire a machine gun at us, they can't penetrate it. Y me dijo, sí, todo el carro es blindado. Así que si cualquier arma dispara, no puede penetrarlo. He took me to the airport. Así que él me llevó al aeropuerto. Uh, well, he took me to the other side of the airport. En, en otras palabras, me llevó al otro lado del aeropuerto. And his helicopter was waiting there. Y allí estaba su helicóptero esperando. I was, I was happy to fly again. Y yo estaba contento de montarme en un helicóptero. And I sat down with, uh, with his pilot and uh, we chatted the whole way. Y yo, two pilots. Claro, y yo me senté justamente al lado del piloto. Esto fue algo bien entretenido porque entre los dos pilotos pasamos conversando. And we flew to an island. Y volamos hasta una isla. And we landed on his personal island. Y nosotros aterrizamos en esta isla. Es una isla de, que le pertenece a ese señor. You want to see it? ¿Quieren ver la isla? Everybody said yes. Ya, todo el mundo dice sí. This is his island. Esa es su isla privada. We landed there in the front yard of the house. Nosotros aterrizamos allí al frente de la casa. And then he gave me a tour of the whole island. Y luego él me dio un recorrido de toda la isla. There's three sets of apartments and complete independent apartments. Hay tres apartamentos que son independientes completamente. I, I would have been happy to spend uh, the night in any of them. I would have been happy to spend the night on any of the three apartments. Y yo hubiera estado feliz de pasar una noche en cualquiera de los tres apartamentos. But he had me stay in this nice building here, right, right there on the left. Pero él me dejó que yo pasara el, eh, mi tiempo allí en este hermoso edificio que ven allí a mano izquierda. Let's put the slide up again, y please. Vamos a poner la la presentación. Yes, okay. Gracias. You notice he has a swimming pool there. Ahí vemos que tiene una piscina. He, he took me to the swimming pool and he said, you see those things shining all around the bottom of the swimming pool? Y él me llevó hasta donde estaba la piscina y me dijo, ¿ves todo eso que está ahí brillando en el piso? It was made up of little, a little blue ceramics. Y estaba hecho de unas cerámicas azules, bien pequeñitas. But he said, you can see shining ceramics all around the bottom. Pero usted puede ver cerámicas que brillan en el suelo, en el piso said, de esta piscina. Those are pure gold. Estos son de oro puro. I said, that must make swimming here very special. Y yo dije, wow, entonces nadar aquí debe ser algo bien especial. Not only that, he said, if you get down and look right along the surface of the, the pool. Ahora, no solamente eso, si tú te bajas y ves así la superficie de la piscina. It looks like the water continues straight out to the ocean. It's one piece of water. Eh, pareciera que el agua se uniera con el agua del océano como que si fuese una sola eh, un solo nivel de agua We spent the weekend, Friday night and Sabbath there. bueno nosotros pasamos el fin de semana el viernes en la noche y el sábado yes, en ese lugar he asked me a lot of questions about the network how we purchased it how come we had no money to buy it y él me hizo muchísimas preguntas sobre la red eh, ¿Cómo hicimos el acuerdo? ¿Cómo no lo hacemos si tenemos dinero para pagarlo? He said, Do you think you will ever pay for the television network? Y él me dijo, me preguntó, ¿será que tú piensas que alguna vez tú vayas a pagar eso? Oh, I know God will pay for it. Y yo le dije, yo sé que Dios lo va a hacer. I don't know how he's going to pay for it, but God owns all the gold and all the silver in the world, so that's why I know he will do it. Yo le dije, yo creo que Dios lo va a hacer. Yo no sé cómo él lo va a hacer. Pero yo sé que Dios es el dueño de todas las cosas, de todo el oro, de toda la plata, todo le pertenece a Él. In my heart, I was thinking, maybe God will use him. Y en mi corazón, yo decía, quizás Dios lo va a usar a Él, no lo sé. He didn't. Pero no lo hizo. He said, we will be watching to see what God does. Y Él me dijo, bueno, vamos a ver qué es lo que va a hacer Dios. He's still watching. Él aún está viendo. What God is doing still today. Lo que Dios aún hace hoy. But I told them, you must be a very happy man. Ahora yo les dije, bueno, tú debes ser un hombre bien feliz. I bet you bring, do you have grandchildren? Yes, he said. Y yo le pregunté, 
¿Tenéis nietos? Y me dijo, sí, claro. I bet, I bet your children and your grandchildren just love coming here and spending the weekend and enjoying being with their grandfather on this island. Y yo, yo le dije, bueno, yo estoy seguro que quizás tus nietos, a tus nietos les encanta venir aquí y disfrutar contigo en esta isla. He said, they've never come. Y él me dijo, nunca han venido. I only bring visitors. Solamente traigo visitas. What about your wife? ¿Qué tal tu esposa? She never comes either. Nunca viene tampoco. She's been here, but she doesn't want to come. Ella ha estado aquí, pero no le gusta venir. The family is more interested in the money than they are in being with the grandfather. El, la, la familia está más interesada en el dinero que en pasar tiempo con el abuelo. I am so sorry. Oh. I am so sorry. Y sabe que lo siento mucho, lo lamento mucho. I didn't realize you were so poor. No me de, no me doy cuenta sino hasta ahora que eras tan pobre. If you don't have your family, you have nothing. Porque si usted no tiene su familia, usted no tiene nada. Your wife doesn't like it. A, a tu esposa no le gusta esto. Your children and grandchildren don't like it. A tus hijos ni a tus nietos tampoco les gusta. That must be a very lonely experience. Debe ser una experiencia bastante triste, bastante said, sola. I love being with my children and my grandchildren. Y él me dijo, a mí me encantaría estar con mis hijos, con mis nietos. On Sabbath morning. Así que sábado de mañana. He had his $75,000 boat take us over to church. Él trajo su bote que vale más o menos unos 75 mil dólares para llevarnos a la iglesia. After church. Y después de la iglesia. We had lunch here. Tuvimos el almuerzo acá. And then he took us out on his million-dollar yacht to do a tour of the bay. Y luego él en su yate que vale más o menos un millón de dólares ese yate nos llevó para hacer un recorrido a lo largo de la bahía. He said, "Look at that house there," and he showed us his house. Y él nos mostró su casa allí. Esta es su casa. No es su casa. No es su casa. A house. Ah, nos mostró una casa. And he said that house belongs to the owner of the big television network Globo. Y esa casa le pertenece al dueño de la televisora brasileña o Globo. Roberto Marinho. Roberto Marinho. And all his they, there was a lot of people there, and the young people were in their boats. Playing around in the water with all the expensive toys of the rich family. Y en la casa, pues bueno, tenía muchas visitas, tenía mucha gente. Estaban los jóvenes allí disfrutando, gozando con esos juguetes bastante caros que se suelen tener esas familias adineradas. I got, I got the feeling that he thought highly of himself. Ahora yo eh, tuve, o sea, tuve la idea de que él estaba tratando de esconderse a sí mismo. No, he thought highly. He, he had the. Oh, de que él pensaba, de que él se estimaba a sí mismo eh, elevadamente. Because he had four boys. Porque él tenía cuatro muchachos. And he called all his boys Robert. Y a cada uno le llamaba por el mismo nombre. That was their second name. Robert. Every okay. one of the four boys had the second name Robert. Y cada uno de sus de sus muchachos el segundo nombre de ellos era Robert. He's dead now. Él ahora ha fallecido. And the, the, I heard that he took nothing with him. Y yo escuché que no se llevó nada con él. No money. Ni dinero. No material possessions. Ni posesiones materiales. I think he's rotting by now. Creo que para este momento ya se está ya está descompuesto ya. And that's what we take with us. Nothing when y we die. Eso es lo que nosotros nos llevamos cuando morimos. Nada. The wealth that you have is in what God has given you, your talent, skills, your family. La riqueza que tú tienes es lo que Dios te da. Tu familia, tus talentos, tus habilidades. Some of us inherited a good family. Others, sadly, inherited a very painful family experience. Algunos de nosotros hemos heredado una buena familia. Mientras que hay otros que tristemente han heredado experiencias familiares dolorosas. All families have certain problems, but some have very severe problems. Ahora, alguna, todas las familias pasamos por diferentes experiencias, eh, pero hay unas que pasan por otras por experiencias que son más dolorosas que otras. Some families are very disordered. They never know how to discipline children, and they, everybody does what they want to, and it's chaos. Por ejemplo, hay familias que son muy desordenadas. Eh, nadie sabe lo que es la palabra disciplina eh, los hijos crecen sin ningún orden eh, y todo es caos 
Some children hit the parents and the parents do nothing. Hay familias donde los hijos le pegan a los padres y los padres hacen nada. That's the time to train the tree. Ese es el momento para entrenar ese árbol. I take advantage of husbands need to protect their wives. Y es allí donde los esposos deben proteger a, su, a sus esposas. You tell your children. Y decirle a los niños. That lady is my wife. Esa mujer es mi esposa. Anybody touches her, I am going to beat them. Y cualquiera que la toque, lo voy a golpear. You respect your mother or you're going to catch it. O respetas a tu madre o te doy. And the children realize the mother is the most important figure in the home and the children learn to obey their parents. Y es así, a veces, como los niños aprenden que la madre es la figura más importante de su hogar y aprenden a respetarla. You raise your hand against the mother You let your legs are going to feel it. Y si tú levantas la mano a tu madre, tu pierna va a, va a sentirlo. The father is responsible if there's violence in the home. Y es el padre el que es responsable si hay violencia en ese hogar. And if, if you don't learn that, it goes into the third and fourth generation, the problems of the home, and we inherit that. Y si eso no es resuelto, este mismo problema va a la tercera, segunda, tercera y cuarta generación. Nosotros heredamos eso. If you accept Jesus Christ into your life, suddenly there are changes in your life. Ahora, si usted acepta a Jesucristo en su vida, de repente surgen cambios en su vida, en su familia. Everything you inherited begins to heal the bad and God begins to replace your home with his presence. Y aquello que usted ha heredado, aquello malo que usted ha heredado, Empieza el Señor a sanarlo y empieza a reemplazarlo con lo bueno. For example, there's some people that say, I will never forgive him for what he did or what she did. Por ejemplo, hay personas que dicen, yo nunca voy a perdonar a esa persona por lo que me hizo, por lo que me dijo. When you say those words, I will never forgive. Cuando nosotros decimos ese tipo de palabras, nunca lo voy a perdonar. There are like thorns growing on your nervous system and it begins to block up all the normal communication in your body. Es como eso crea una reacción en tu sistema nervioso, el cual es como que si crecieran espinas y eso eh, bloquea tu capacidad de respuesta. When you say, I choose to forgive. Pero en cambio, cuando usted dice, yo Elijo perdonar. You don't have to feel like forgiving. You just have to choose to forgive. Usted no tiene que sentirlo. Usted tiene que elegir el perdón. I make the decision to forgive him or her for what she did to me. Yo tomo la decisión de perdonarle a esta mujer, a este hombre por lo que me ha hecho, por lo que me ha dicho. Immediately the body begins to repair itself and your nervous system begins to function more normally and eventually your feelings will catch up with you. Inmediatamente su sistema nervioso responde a este tipo de de afirmación y empieza un proceso de sanación y de conducta y de sentimiento finalmente que está en armonía con lo que usted ha dicho. And your home will heal, you will heal and your family will be joyful and thankful. Y usted va a sanar, su hogar va a sanar y su familia va a estar agradecida. Aunt Becky and I, we inherited from our parents a very good home. De, tanto la tía Becky como yo heredamos de nuestros padres buenos hogares. They were consecrated to God and His work. Ellos, nuestros padres, eran padres consagrados a Dios they worked, y a su trabajo. They worked for the denomination for many, many years. Trabajaron para la denominación por muchos, muchos años. When they were very young, they made the, they were called to work in Bolivia. Y cuando estaban jóvenes, ambas familias fueron llamadas a trabajar en, uh, en Bolivia. So they came with their children and they moved, my pain-laws moved to La Paz and my parents came and worked in the jungles of the Beni. Y mis, fa mis familiares políticos, ellos vinieron con sus hijos, mis familiares políticos se mudaron a La Paz y nuestra familia se mudó a, al Beni. So I called my mother-in-law, I called all the missionaries uncle and aunt. Así que yo llamo a todos los misioneros, tío, tía. 
And so when I got married, my aunt became my second mother. Así que cuando nos casamos, cuando yo me casé, esta tía se fue se convirtió como mi segunda madre. My father-in-law served as treasurer and director of education for what is now the Bolivia Union. Mi suegro sirvió como tesorero de y departamental de educación en lo que hoy día es la Unión Boliviana. And as treasurer of our what is now the university. Y también como tesorero en lo que hoy día es la universidad. My father came as a pastor to open up the work throughout all the jungles of the vast area called Beni. Y mi padre vino como pastor para abrir la obra en el, la, la vasta, en, en el vasto departamento del Beni, de Selva. And I always remember my mother having patience at home. Y yo recuerdo siempre a mi madre teniendo pacientes en casa. As time went on, they even got more prepared for the work. Y a medida que pasaba el tiempo, ellos se prepararon aún más para la obra. My mother-in-law studied nursing and took care of thousands, dozens of thousands of patients in Peru. Mi suegra eh, decidió estudiar enfermería y cuidó de miles y miles de pacientes en Perú. My father studied, became a commercial pilot and a registered nurse. Mi padre estudió enfermería, él se hizo un enfermero y también estudió aviación comercial. He taught me how to fly. Y él fue el que me enseñó cómo volar. So they gave me an inheritance of service to others. Así que de ellos recibí la herencia para servir a otros. A ver, vamos a ver el micrófono. No tenemos audio, por favor. Okay, we got it. Thank Ahora you. sí. Both sets of parents My in-laws and my parents eventually became full-time volunteers. Y eventualmente, tanto mis padres como mis parientes políticos, mis padres políticos, se convirtieron en voluntarios tiempo completo. So, we saw what God did for them. Así que nosotros vimos lo que Dios hizo por ellos. And we decided eventually after 30 years of working for the church. Y luego nosotros decidimos después de 30 años de trabajo en la iglesia. We also, my wife and I and Becky and I became full-time volunteers. Nosotros, la tía Becky y yo también nos convertimos en misioneros voluntarios tiempo completo. Our parents left us a heritage, an inheritance. Nuestros padres nos dejaron una herencia. It was a good inheritance. Y era una buena herencia. It was not properties. No era We did not inherit any properties. Nosotros, ninguno de nosotros heredamos ninguna propiedad. We did not inherit any assets. Tampoco heredamos algún bien o algún activo. What we inherited was an example. Lo que nosotros heredamos fue el ejemplo. And their example makes us more responsible for continuing the work than somebody who did not inherit a good example. Y para nosotros, el ejemplo que ellos dejaron nos llena de mayor responsabilidad para llevar la obra adelante. Mucho más que quizás a otra persona que no creció o no tuvo ese tipo de ejemplo. God gives each of us an inheritance and we are to build on it to continue the work that was given to us. Dios da a cada uno de nosotros una herencia y nos corresponde a nosotros construir bajo, sobre esa herencia para llevar su obra adelante. Let's look at what Jesus says about a steward of Ahora, whatever talents and skills you have. Ahora vamos a ver lo que dice Jesús sobre lo que es un mayordomo, un mayordomo sobre okay. cualquier talento o bien que se le da. Luke 12, 42 to 48 says. Lucas 12, 42 al 48 nos dice. And the Lord said, Who is then a faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make rule over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Y dijo el Señor, ¿Quién es el mayordomo fiel y prudente al cual su Señor pondrá sobre su casa para que a tiempo les dé su ración? Blessed is that servant whom the Lord when he comes shall find so doing. Bienaventurado aquel siervo al cual cuando su Señor venga le halle haciendo así. Of truth I say unto, unto you that he will be made ruler over all that he has. En verdad os digo que le pondrá sobre todos sus bienes. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens and to eat and drink and to be drunken. 
Mas aquel siervo dijera en su corazón, mi señor tarda en venir y comenzar a golpear a los criados y a las criadas y a comer y a beber y a embragarse. The Lord of the servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and at an hour when he is not aware and he will cut him in sunder and appoint his portion with the unbelievers. Vendrá el Señor de aquel siervo en, aquel, en día que éste no espera y a la hora que no sabe y le castigará duramente y le pondrá con los infieles. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. Aquel siervo que conociendo la voluntad de su Señor no se preparó ni hizo conforme a su voluntad, recibirá muchos azotes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. Mas el que sin conocerla hizo cosas dignas de azotes será azotado poco. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required, and to men who have committed much, of them they will ask more. Porque a todo aquel a quien se haya dado mucho, mucho se le demandará. Y al que mucho se le haya confiado, más se le pedirá. Jesus here is not talking about worldly leaders, government leaders, or business leaders. Aquí Jesús no está hablando sobre líderes gubernamentales, o líderes globales, o líderes en el área económica. Even though the same principles apply. A pesar que los principios también se aplican en esas áreas. Jesus is talking about the spiritual leadership of the church. Pero Jesús está hablando al liderazgo espiritual de la iglesia. If you haven't been given spiritual authority over others. Si a usted se le ha dado autoridad espiritual. What does it mean when you say in your heart, "My Lord, delayeth is coming"? ¿Qué significa cuando en su corazón usted dice, mi Señor tarda? What does it mean? ¿Qué significa eso? It means you're not teaching the imminent coming of Jesus Christ and how to get ready. Significa que usted no está enseñando el regreso inminente de Jesucristo y cómo prepararse. It means to live and plan your work. Significa que usted va a planear su as trabajo. As if you had many years left. Como si usted tiene muchos años. Not in our generation. No en, nuestra, no en mi generación. Someday Jesus will come in another generation. Algún día el Señor vendrá en otra generación. My Lord will delay his coming. It won't happen to me. El Señor tardará en su venida. Eso no va a ocurrirme a mí. The tendency then is to act harsh with your church members. Y la tendencia entonces es actuar duramente con sus miembros de iglesia. You discipline church members and who talk about Jesus coming. Y usted disciplina Aquellos miembros de iglesia quienes hablan de la venida de Jesús. When people, when members say, get ready, get ready, get ready, they go, that's disobedience. Don't talk about it. Cuando hay miembros de iglesia que dice, tenemos que alistarnos, tenemos que alistarnos, tenemos que alistarnos, allí hay quien levanta la mano y dice, esto es desobediencia. When really they're obeying Jesus Christ. Cuando estas personas están dispuestos a obedecer a Cristo. What does it mean to eat and drink with the drunken. ¿Qué significa el comer, el beber, embriagarse con los borrachos? ¿Qué será eso? It means getting drunk with the wine of Babylon. Significa embriagarse con el vino de Babilonia. It means participating in false doctrine, false church, and having an adulterous relationship with the great whore. Significa participar con doctrinas falsas, con cultos falsos, y participar de, la, de esa eh, ramera eh, de, de, de Babilonia, de la gran ramera. It means signing agreements, like if we were a wedding, signing agreement with a whore. Significa firmar pactos, como que si fuera una boda, firmar un pacto con una ramera. I don't know all the countries where we have signed agreements. Ahora, no sé todos los países en los cuales nosotros hemos firmado acuerdos. But we have signed in Poland, Puerto Rico, and Mexico. Pero hemos firmado acuerdos tanto en Polonia como en Puerto Rico como en México. I do know we have invited the priests to teach at our universities. Y también sé que hemos invitado a algunos sacerdotes a enseñar en nuestras universidades. To sit on our boards para que ellos se sienten en nuestras juntas directivas to join our committees at world sessions. y también para unirse a los comités en reuniones anuales. Hemos 
Hemos también invitado a sacerdotes, a curas, a monjas, para trabajar en nuestras instituciones. Her doctrines and authority are found throughout most of our institutions. Y sus doctrinas, sus formas, se encuentran a lo largo también de nuestras instituciones. And if you believe Jesus is not coming for a long time, naturally you will think, well, this has nothing to do with the end time. This is just a, a political alliance. Y si usted piensa, si usted tiene en su mente la idea, bueno, Jesús no va a venir sino un largo tiempo. Entonces, para usted este tipo de acuerdos es sencillamente un acuerdo político. But this is what it means to drink the wine with the drunken. Pero este tipo de acuerdos es lo que significa beber con los borrachos, it entregarse con los borrachos. Spiritual adultery. Significa un adulterio espiritual. You cannot be part of the bride without spot or wrinkle and be living in adultery. Usted no puede ser parte de esa esposa de Cristo sin arrugas, sin manchas y al mismo tiempo cometer adulterio. God soon will cleanse his church. Así que Dios prontamente va a limpiar a su iglesia. And all those adulterous pastors and administrators will be will disappear, be swept aside. Y todos esos pastores y líderes adúlteros van a desaparecer de vista. You can't mix hot and cold. Hot and cold is called lukewarm. Usted no puede mezclar lo caliente y lo frío. Si lo hace, esto trae tibieza. Revelation 3 says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Y Apocalipsis 3 nos advierte que el Señor vomitará de su boca. God will soon have a beautiful church without spot or wrinkle. Y muy pronto el Señor va a tener una iglesia sin manchas, sin arrugas. A faithful bride who will keep herself apart from a whore. Una esposa fiel que se va a mantener distanciada de cualquier ramera. And she will be faithful to her spiritual husband, Jesus Christ. Y ella va a ser fiel a su esposo espiritual, a Jesucristo. There's one more thing I need to tell you, pastors. Y hay una cosa más que puedo decir. You will be judged according to how you treat your members with love and kindness. A los pastores, digo lo siguiente, usted va a ser juzgado de la misma forma como usted trata a sus miembros como usted lo juzga a sus miembros you disfellowship and discipline church members for studying and preaching the truth hay ustedes algunos pastores sacan de la membresía castigan disciplinan a miembros que desean estudiar la verdad for distributing great controversies o por distribuir libros como el gran conflicto for warning others how to get ready for Jesus coming por alertar a otras personas a prepararse para la venida de Cristo for moving to the country por mudarse al campo. For having a conscience problem with taking the shot. O por tener un problema de conciencia por una inyección. Church presidents, administrators and pastors who treat God's lambs and sheep that way will soon be disciplined by the chief shepherd. Y aquellos pastores, aquellos administradores de iglesia que tratan de esta forma a las ovejas de Cristo muy pronto Cristo mismo va a lidiar con ellos. That might be Stephen in the painting, but it's every member that has been disfellowshipped for teaching truth. Ahora eso que ustedes ven allí representa a Esteban como él fue apedreado, pero realmente representa a cada miembro de iglesia que predica la verdad y cómo está siendo tratado. Disfellowship for preaching the truth. Who ever heard of that? Ahora quién ha escuchado que alguien pierde la membresía de su iglesia? Porque predica la verdad. It's happening today all over the world. Está ocurriendo hoy día alrededor del mundo. That's okay. Don't worry. God knows who His children are. Ahora está bien. No se preocupe. Dios sabe quiénes son sus hijos. Those who mistreat the sheep will soon be punished with eternal death. Y muy pronto aquellos quienes maltratan a las ovejas van a recibir el castigo, the anger muerte eterna. Of the chief shepherd is against you. Y la ira del gran pastor está sobre usted. Ezekiel 34, 2 to 4 and 16. Ezequiel 34, versículos 2 al 4 y versículo 16. Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Así ha dicho Jehová el Señor. Hay de los pastores de Israel que se apacientan a sí mismos. ¿No apacientan los pastores a los rebaños? Ye eat the fat, you close your thigh with wool. You kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. Coméis la grosura y os vestís de la lana, la engordada de goyáis, mas no apacentáis a las ovejas. The disease ye have not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound that which was broken, nor brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, 
but with force and cruelty you have ruled over them. No fortaleciste las débiles, ni curasteis la enferma, no vendasteis la pierna quebrada, no volvisteis al redil la descarriada, ni buscasteis la perdida, sino que os habéis enseñoreado de ellas con dureza y con violencia. And God says, I will seek those that are lost and bring them again that which was driven away, will bind up the broken and strengthen that which was sick, but I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them with judgment. Y dice ahora el Señor, yo buscaré la perdida y haré volver al redil la descarriada. Vendaré la perna quebrada y fortaleceré la débil, mas a la engordada y a la fuerte destruiré. Las apacentaré con justicia. Each of us here today, Cada uno de nosotros hoy, and watching this video, quienes estamos aquí, los que están viendo este video, are shepherds. somos pastores. Some of you mothers have little Lambs to take care of. Algunas de ustedes son madres que tienen ovejitas, corderitos de los cuales cuidar. But you also have neighboring ladies that don't know. Pero también tienen vecinas que no que no saben, quienes no conocen. Some of us are head of households and we are responsible for not only at home but also at work. Y algunos de nosotros somos cabeza de hogar, quienes no solamente somos responsables por nuestros hogares, sino también por lo que pasa en nuestros trabajos. Some of us have given one talent, some two talents, and some even more, five talents. Algunos de nosotros se nos ha dado un talento, dos talentos, algunos hasta cinco talentos. Let's see what Matthew 25 says. Mire lo que dice Mateo 25. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man who traveled into a far country and he called his own servants and gave them, delivered unto them his goods. Porque el reino de los cielos es como un hombre que yéndose lejos llamó a sus siervos y les entregó sus bienes. Unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. Every man according to his ability and straightway he took his journey. A uno dio cinco talentos, a otro dos, y a otro uno, a cada uno conforme a su capacidad, y luego se fue lejos. Then he that had received five talents went and traded the same and made another five. Y el que había recibido cinco talentos fue y negoció con ellos y ganó otros cinco talentos. And likewise he who received two also gained another two. Asimismo, el que había recibido dos ganó también otros dos. But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Pero el que había recibido uno fue y cavó en la tierra y escondió el dinero de su Señor. But after a long time the Lord cometh and reckoneth with his servants. Pero luego de mucho tiempo vino el Señor de aquellos siervos y arregló cuentas con ellos. And so he that received five talents came and brought another five and said, Lord, you gave me five. Behold, I have gained another five more for you. Y llegando el que había recibido cinco talentos trajo otros cinco talentos diciendo, Señor, cinco talentos me entregaste. Aquí tienes. He ganado otros cinco talentos sobre ellos. And his Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over few things. I will make you rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Y llegando el que había recibido los cinco talentos, eh, y su Señor le dijo, Bien, buen siervo y fiel, sobre poco has sido fiel, sobre mucho te pondré. Entra en el gozo de tu Señor. And he that received two talents, the same response. Y lo mismo ocurrió con aquel que tenía dos talentos, but la verse, misma respuesta. But in verse 24, when he had received one talent, came and said, I knew you were a hard man and reaping where you had not sown and gathering where you had not strawed. I was afraid and went and hid my talent in the earth. Here, I give you back that which is yours. Pero luego le, leemos la experiencia del que tenía un talento, en versículo 24. Pero llegando también el que había recibido un talento, dijo... Señor, te conocía que eres hombre duro, que ciegas donde no sembraste y recoges donde no esparciste, por lo cual tuve miedo y fui y escondí tu talento en la tierra. Aquí tienes lo que es tuyo. And his Lord and said unto him, you wicked and slothful servant. Respondiendo su Señor le dijo, siervo malo y negligente. You knew that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Sabías que ciego donde no sembré y que recojo donde no esparcí. You should have given the, money, given the money with the exchangers and I should have had mine with usury when I came back. Por tanto, debías haber dado mi dinero a los banqueros y al venir yo hubiera recibido lo que es mío con los intereses. Take that talent from him and give it to him that has five talents, ten talents. Quítale pues el talento y dadlo al que tiene diez talentos. For everyone that hath it shall be given and he shall have abundance but unto him that hath not 
shall be taken away even that which he had. Porque al que tiene le será dado y tendrá más. Y al que no tiene, aún lo que tiene le será quitado. And cast on this unprofitable servant out into outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Y al siervo inútil, echadle en las tinieblas de afuera. Allí será el lloro y el crujir de dientes. Not all of us receive the same amount of inheritance. Ahora, no todos nosotros recibimos la misma cantidad de herencia. But all of us are required to take what we have and multiply it and use it for God. Pero todos somos llamados a tomar lo que tenemos y multiplicarlo para el Señor. Some people, almost everybody, wants to manage more than they have. Ahora, la mayoría quiere manejar más de lo que tiene. But if you manage well with what you do have, God will entrust you with more. Pero si usted maneja bien lo que ya usted tiene, el Señor entonces podrá confiarle algo más. So my question is, how do you manage the little bit that you have today? Ahora la pregunta viene, ¿cómo manejas lo poco que tienes hoy? Well, the little widow in the Bible gave all that she had to God. Bueno, la viuda en la Biblia dio todo lo que ella tenía, lo puso and, al Señor. And God knew that and rewarded her accordingly in secret. Y el Señor, sabiendo esto, recompensó en secreto a esa mujer. Do you use a little bit you have to advance God's work around you? Usted utiliza lo que tiene, lo poco que tiene, para poder avanzar la obra de Dios a su alrededor. We should be saying, Lord, thank you for the little bit that I have. Multiply it and save souls with this little bit. Nosotros deberíamos decir, Señor, gracias por lo poco que tengo. Utilízalo, multiplícalo para salvar más almas a mi alrededor. What is the secret of getting more? ¿Cuál es el secreto para obtener más? Given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Dad y se os dará. Medida buena, apretada, remecida y rebosando darán en vuestro regazo. The more you give, the more you receive. Mientras usted más da, más recibe. Oh, I know, but you don't receive to keep it. Ah, pero usted no recibe para mantenerlo en el bolsillo. You receive it to give. Usted lo recibe para dar. What happens when it rains heavy in Bolivia? Ahora, ¿qué pasa cuando llueve bien fuerte en Bolivia? ¿Qué ocurre? The water runs to the rivers. El agua corre a los ríos, ¿cierto? Then it goes to the Rio Beni and the Rio Mamoré. Luego esa agua va al Rio Beni o al Rio Mamoré. And then those rivers join together and give it to Rio Madeira in Brazil. Y luego eso, se une esos ríos y lo dan al Rio Madeira en Brasil. And then Rio Madeira keeps on going south and it gives it to the Amazon. Y luego ese río sigue creciendo desde el sur y lo desemboca en el Amazonas. The rivers don't keep the water, they always pass it on. Los ríos no, man, no mantienen el agua. Pasan el agua de un lugar a otro. And then the Amazon River, which is the biggest river in the world, gives it to the ocean. Y luego el río Amazonas, que es el más grande que hay, lo da al océano. And the ocean gives it right back. Y el océano lo devuelve. God wants a people today that know how to give in order to receive to give again. El pueblo, Dios espera que es un pueblo que esté dispuesto a dar y ¿Para qué? Para recibir, para dar nuevamente. Every time I'm in Florida, I take my airplane to get maintained with a mechanic that I really trust. He's really good. Ahora, cada vez que yo estoy en la Florida, tengo la oportunidad de que pueda hacer mantenimiento en mi avión a este, con este mecánico al cual yo le tengo toda confianza. 50 years experience. Tiene 50 años de experiencia. They bring him airplanes from all over the world. Y hay personas que llevan allí aviones de todas partes del mundo. And I said, Bill, can I pray for you? I pray for him every time I'm there. Y yo cada vez que voy le digo, Bill, puedo orar por ti. You know what he said? Y sabes qué me dice? Please pray for me. Por favor, ore por mí. I want to win the lottery. Yo quiero ganarme la lotería. <laughs> I said that might not be the best for you. Y yo le dije, no, eso no, eso no, no creo que sea lo mejor para ti. Do you know what happens when people win the lottery? ¿Tú sabes lo que pasa cuando la gente se gana la lotería? Here's a family that won 528 million in a Tennessee lottery. Aquí vemos a una familia se ganó 528 millones de dólares en la lotería en el estado de Tennessee. 70% of people who win the lottery, they lose all of it within a few years. They spend it all. Y el 70% de las personas que se ganan la lotería 
En unos pocos años ya no tienen nada. They all say, I wasn't any happier. I'm just as happy as I was before I won it. Y eh, ellos muchas veces dicen, no soy más feliz que antes, después de haberme ganado esta lotería. But many of them say, I'm more miserable and angry than I used to be. De hecho, hay muchos que dicen, ahora soy más miserable que antes. I fight with all my family. He peleado con toda mi familia. They all want to take it from me. Porque todo el mundo quiere echar mano a lo, a lo que me Families gané. Families break up. Hay familias que se destruyen. Before divorces, stealing, lying, and even murder. Hay muertes incluso, hay mentiras, hay divorcio, hay de todo. But Pero, there was an older couple in the state of Florida. Había una pareja ya mayor en el estado de Florida. And they won many millions of dollars. Y ellos ganaron millones de dólares. The little couple looked at each other and said, "Honey, we don't need this money, do we?" Y uno, ellos se miraron los unos a los otros y dijeron, "Amor, nosotros no necesitamos esto." We could give it to our children, but then they will become miserable. Y nosotros podemos darle esto a nuestros hijos, pero van a, van a estar miserables con este dinero. Our community doesn't have a hospital. Let's build a hospital. Ahora nuestra comunidad no tiene un hospital, así que vamos a construir un hospital. And then they built a high school. Y luego construyeron también un, un liceo, un bachillerato, una escuela. And they gave it all away. Y repartieron todo lo que se había ganado. And they said we are the happiest people in the world. Y luego dijeron, ahora sí somos los más felices del mundo. We have nothing, we gave it all away. No tenemos nada, lo dimos Nobody todo. Will try to steal it from us. Y nadie va a tratar de robarnos. Nobody will come to our house and beg us. Nadie tampoco va a venir a pedirnos nada. In fact, if you if you fight depression, if you're a depressed person, you need to learn to give more and you'll be very very happy with giving. De hecho, si usted está batallando con depresión, sabe algo que puede hacer, de más, de más, y you eso want, lo va a ayudar. You want happiness? Start giving. Usted quiere sentirse feliz? Empiece a dar. God is the ultimate giver in the universe. Y Dios es el dador más grande del universo. All life comes from God. Toda la vida proviene de Dios. The trees, the people, the animals. Los árboles, las personas, los animales. Rain showers to help our crops grow. La lluvia que ayuda a que nuestros cultivos crezcan. Comes from God. Viene de Dios. Good and the bad, all get rain. Todo, tanto lo bueno como lo malo, Sunlight. viene de Dios. La luz del sol. Sun, the sun was created. El sol fue creado to give us a suntan. Para Darnos un, una quemadita de sol. Un bronceado. Un bronceado. <laughs> uh, vitamin D. La vitamina D. Health. Salud. That's why staying in your apartment during a quarantine and never coming out is bad health. Es por eso que estar en cuarentena en un apartamento sin sol, eso no es saludable. But the children who live in the country, they're all playing out in the grass and playing the football. Pero los chicos que están en el campo esos pasaron todo el tiempo jugando fútbol afuera. And they're healthier. Y ellos están más felices. God gives abundance to everybody. Dios da abundancia para Life, todos. Life, water, food, sunshine. Tanto la vida como el agua como la luz. God created the sun to be a blessing to us, not to worship. Dios creó el sol para que fuese bendición para nosotros, no para adorarlo. You don't worship the sun any more than you worship the rock in your front yard. Y usted no adora al sol ni tampoco la roca que está al frente de su casa. Or the dog that runs in front of your yard. O al perro que tiene al frente de su the casa. The sun is not a god; it's a created planet. El sol no es eh, un dios, es sencillamente un astro. God is the creator and he alone is to be worshiped. Dios es el creador y solamente él debe ser adorado. Your time, tu tiempo, your influence, tu influencia, your talents, sus talentos, your skills, tus habilidades, everything you have, todo lo que tienes, everything you are, todo lo que usted es, I encourage you, le motivo, give it to God, déselo a Dios, put it on the altar, colóquelo en el altar, everything I am, Lord, everything I have is yours. Señor, todo lo que soy, todo lo que tengo, it es came tuyo. from your hands. Viene de tus manos. And I give it to you. Y yo ahora te lo doy. And someday soon, y muy pronto, we will hear these words. El, usted va a escuchar estas palabras. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Bien, buen siervo y fiel. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Sobre 
poco has sido fiel, sobre mucho te pondré. God bless you. Dios te bendiga. from Gospel Ministries International here in McDonald, Tennessee. I'm in our little GMI cafe here with a real missionary family. This is the Greaserts family, and let me introduce you to them. We have Nathaniel and his wife Kendra, and three cute little girls here. I'm going to let them say what their names are. What's your name? Elsie. Elsie, okay, and what? Daddy what's... and Candy. Yeah? And Daddy. <laughs> and what's your name? Emmy. Emmy, okay, and what's your name? Kenzie. Kenzie, okay. <laughs> they all end in E. Yeah. Let me ask you first uh, where you are currently doing your mission work. Right now, we're working in Belize with uh, a school called MOVE. It's a missionary training school. And over this last year, uh, working with MOVE, we've worked in Colombia and we've worked in Belize. Okay. And that's with Jeff Sutton? That's right. Organization? That's right. Jeff Sutton and Jeff and Fauna and Kayla. And, yeah. I see. Kendra, I, I think you have your hands full already with, uh, with three girls. Uh huh. And you're doing homeschooling as well. Yes, for my oldest Wait, daughter, we do homeschool. homeschool okay. So, yeah. Are you in homeschool? No. Not yet. Oh, but you will be, right? Okay. Do you girls uh, participate in any of the mission work? What do you do? Um, we help out when we go visiting, and you visit in the community. Yeah, and I was. When we went on our mission trip, I was helping telling children's stories. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. You did kind of like a little, helped out with a little vacation Bible school, and you helped yeah. tell children's stories with felts, right? Yeah. And you also help sometimes work on the farm and do some weeding and whatever jobs need yeah. to be done, and you help sing in the choir too. I do. Yeah. Do you help in the garden? Yes. Yeah, you yeah. help in the garden. You yeah. pull weeds. You yeah. pull weeds? Yeah, we do. <laughs> We're ready. You're ready? Okay. So, Nathaniel, what do you teach at MOVE? So, I teach uh, the mechanics class there. Um, at MOVE, we teach some very practical skills to the students. It's, it's like a missionary boot camp as the students go through. And, uh, so, when you're training people to be missionaries. Right? That's right. That's okay. right. Predominantly young people. Um, who, who feel a calling to, to mission work. Um, and what they do is they spend three months there in Belize uh, learning some skills, and then they uh, have committed to spend six months at a project that's uh, established and ongoing. I see. And so you, what do you teach, the mechanics? I, I teach the mechanics class. That's okay. Right. And what's your background that, that gives you that skill? So I actually was an engineer for a number of years, and uh, I'm also, I recently became an A&P mechanic. That's a, a mechanic certified to work on aircraft and uh, also a pilot. And so the mechanic skills, I would say, come from just growing up, working on, working on cars, working on things, and then uh, some of the education I've had on working on airplanes. I've used that 
to, to share with the students some I skills see. that will help them. Are they fixing cars or small engines or what? A lot of the things that they work on are small engines. You know, in the mission field, having things like a chainsaw, weed eaters, lawn mowers, um, some projects will have tractors and things like that. It's really good to have someone around that can fix exactly. those and maintain them, of course. Um, and that's a big part of what we teach them is how to maintain them so that they don't have to do quite as much uh, fixing. But, uh, and, and you know what's interesting, you can actually reach out to people in the communities. One of the things that's appealing to some of the men in the community is to bring out their, their broken weed eaters, their broken mowers, and uh, we offer to fix them. Uh, and that gives us an opportunity to get to know them and to reach out to them and have an opportunity to share, share the gospel as well. I see. And do you, they get some kind of uh, training in, in public speaking as well or some? They, they get a training in evangelism. Um, they, do, they do Bible studies, they do small group studies, and they do sermons as well. I see. And you participate in that? Uh, yes. I, I've been involved in, in helping to do some of the evangelistic series at different churches. Um, and, and the staff provide evaluations for the students, give them feedback on the things that went well and areas that they can, that they can, that it can work on and grow in. And you, you mentioned Colombia. Um, do you know Spanish? Are you learning Spanish? We, we're all actually learning Spanish right now. Uh, and okay. Colombia was a, the six months we were there was a good opportunity for us to start, to start learning. Okay, six, six months. So can you say anything in Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> or have you forgotten it? <laughs> I can speak. You can speak Spanish? Oh, okay, and you too? Oh. <laughs> okay, well, let's back up a little bit. And um, I always love to hear how God leads people into mission work. So I'm kind of curious, Where did you always want to be a missionary or... Did the Lord put that in your heart later in life? Or what's... You know, I, I think um, for, for us, as far as full-time missions, that was something that came on later in life. Um, we had the opportunity, both Kendra and I, to work um, in doing short-term mission work. And the, the things that we saw God doing when we went out and we helped build churches, when we helped build schools, and we had an opportunity in 2014 to go and help build some classrooms and administration building at MOVE, we just saw how God was working um, through the people who had dedicated their lives to serving in the mission field. Um, and it started to get us to think more about what would it look like to get involved more than just on a part-time basis, but on a full-time basis. And that was something that we were praying for for, about, for quite a few years. I see. So when did you make that decision to go full-time? So in 2019, uh, in, in July, is when we uh, stepped away from life as it was before into a life of uh, being committed to doing full-time mission work. I see. And Kendra, was that a struggle for you? Were you on board from the I start? Was, or? I was on board. Originally, when, um, in 2014, when we went down to the MOVE campus, we... Uh, had Kenzie and she was 22 months old and my initial response is said no I'm not going on a mission trip to somewhere that I don't know and take my young child but God, Nat was praying about that and he prayed that um, if it was God's will that he'd open my heart and I was able to talk to Fauna Sutton who has been a missionary for a long time and we work with down in Belize and she answered my questions and made me feel more comfortable about what it was like there and um, that they had their own children and they did just fine there. So that was my initial hesitancy. But then um, in 2019, when we decided, okay, let's, let's go for this, I was totally on board and said, you know, whatever God wants us to do, I'm willing to do. Okay, wow, that's great. Um, I guess Colombia was a little different when going into a place where you don't know the language. Right. So that right. was a, an additional step out of your comfort zone. Right, right. Well, initially, we didn't know we were going to Colombia. We thought we were going to Belize. But because of the pandemic, um, Belize wasn't open to um, basically work visas and things of that nature. So it was closed at that point. 
however Columbia was. And so it was pretty last minute and our initial was like, oh, that, this is new, but um, <laughs> we knew that God was leading us. We had just moved out of our house that we were staying in in Michigan and we were on our way down here to Tennessee and, and we found out we were going to Columbia. So um, we knew that God was gonna lead us whatever happened. And you know, um, not speaking Spanish really wasn't a problem. It was a good environment to learn and grow in. I was more concerned about, you know, my girls' safety and, you know, them getting lost in the marketplace or you know, out in the woods or something. But God protected them the whole time and they were safe. And it was a really positive experience. We're really glad that we got to spend six months there. Uh, we never expected that we'd find ourselves in Columbia, South America. So we felt uh, blessed and privileged to get to have that opportunity. Yeah. Great. That's awesome. So what does the future hold? Well, um, we're really enjoying working with MOVE. Um, we love to see uh, the impact that's making on the lives of young people and the communities that they, that they work in. Um, so at least for the next year, our plans are to be there. There's a, a new training session starting up in February and uh, we'll be heading down there for that. And there'll be another uh, training uh, session in the fall that we'll be involved with. I see. And what do you do in between sessions? Is it repair work and all and preparation? Yeah. So um, as I mentioned, I did training uh, for being able to work on airplanes. I am also a pilot. Um, there is work to do up here on aircraft that are um, serving different missions. So I'm involved with Jeff. We usually are doing some maintenance uh, and also looking at uh, uh, there are other projects that we're trying to help out and, and do logistics for. Uh, while, while we're up here. So there's always plenty to do. Um, and that's one of the things I really love about mission work um, is there's, there's, a, there's a lot of needs. There's a lot of opportunities uh, to apply skills in different areas. And there's always opportunities to grow because there's always new things to learn. Great. So we might even get to see you next summer. Yeah, that's right. All right. <laughs> we're looking forward. To Sounds it. great. Well, I want to thank you um, for visiting us, coming by. Thank and uh, taking us. this opportunity to share with our viewers all of what's going on. And we hope that you've been blessed. If giving is reward enough for you, if daily bread is bread enough for you, if God's timing is soon enough for you, you might be a missionary. Gospel Ministries International Have you sat us again? It is truly my privilege to visit you again in a row. Uh, thanks for uh, Elder Johnson, his uh, kind invitation, and so that I have the opportunity to share with you again. And uh, I'm, I want to thank you for our pastor serving in Philippines. I also come from Philippines, and Silam. <laughs> So God bless your work in Palawan. We were there uh, for a couple of times. I hold one evangelistic meetings for the Chinese. And we had uh, two owners, Toyota owner and another, I forgot which one, is also owner of automobiles came to the meetings. They brought all the Chinese families there. And so I'm grateful for the workers, missionaries, the opportunities even for us also working in Philippines. Now this morning I'd like to take you to a, a different pathway and we'll continue with our mission experience and uh, how to help people in the mission field to find the answers.
So I've given the title for today as the origin and final destination of humanity. It is mainly addressed to the search of the Buddhists and how we can address their questions and lead them to the answers the Bible provides. So I will start with a prayer and then we will uh, get into our journey together. Father, we thank you for this Sabbath. We thank you for your word, for the Bible, your revelation, to outline the plan of salvation and also the origin and the human destiny and our the final destination. Father, as we open your word, we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the Buddhist world, now Buddhist is the fourth largest world religion in this world today. The basic questions they ask are these. Where are we from? Where are we going? And how can I get there? Now they also provide some answers in my studies or in my work and in my visits with uh, mingling with the Buddhists. And I found their answers quite interesting. This is how they answer the question. And they said, where are you from? Uh, it said, I come from the place, I think I got it wrong. I come from the place where I came from. It doesn't look like they answer the question. Where are you going? I go to the place I'm where I'm going. And they're satisfied with that. To, to, uh, to us that who know the, the answer from the Bible, it's kind of like, sounds like a play of words. But many are satisfied with that. And uh, they even write the answer, you know, as uh, calligraphy hung on the wall because this answer seems to be pretty smart. And... For Buddhists, they have a story about how humans came into this world. And it's quite interesting. The way they describe it is that we come from another planet, so to speak. What they call the Guang Yin Tian, a light sound world. People you can fly, have halos. But somehow they came to this world they eat to eat some fruit. And then the body get very heavy. They couldn't fly anymore, so they stay. Ah, you're laughing. You can see immediately they copy something from the Bible. The, the, the story was there before, but somehow it got changed. So later on, they have the man eating the fruit, and we're trying to figure out what that was. Living in a tropical area for a long time, 10 years now, to me, it probably is durian. <laughs> I don't know. Just making up. Uh, and uh, so that is uh, one way to say when the gods from the heaven of uh, light and sound came to this world, they were no longer that perfect and had a already lost their wisdom. That's kind of like the, the story of the fall, according to the Buddhist version. Just to cut in one word here. In the Chinese Buddhist scripture, sutras, there is one sutra tells about the seventh day cycle. Every other day is normal day, but the seventh day is a day that connects heaven and the earth. Isn't that interesting? Even, even the Sabbath, you can find that in Buddhist sutras. Now, the, the final destiny, a final destination for the Buddhists is called the Western Blissful World. In the Chinese, it's uh, Xifang Jila Shijie. Now, you have to think why it's not in the East? Why is it in the West? Where did they get that idea? The final destiny for the human 
humanity is that is a Western blissful world. And they also describe it as the pure land. So in the Buddhist sect, there is a pure land school, very popular among the Chinese. And in this pure land, you don't have the, uh, what, the anger, the, the Buddhist three poisons, three poisons with humanity. One is anger. One is greed, and one is ignorance. And they, and they say that this is a, now also in Buddhist Buddhist world, we're not the only one who have the three angels' messages. The Buddhists have three angels' messages. They said there are three angels constantly warning us. And these three angels, it's just remind us if we follow into the trap of those things, we, there's no hope for us. And uh, for them, it's talking about uh, life and death. It's a different issue. It's not like the, what we say, but it's using the seminal terminologies. Pure land, it is the final destination for Buddhist. Now, this, I know this uh, may not be familiar to you, but it's for the Buddhist world, especially for the Chinese Buddhists. This is a well-known novel, Journey to the West. Journey to the West for, this is a novel written about uh, a couple, of, I think it's a two or three or four hundred years ago. And it's talking about a group of uh, four people uh, a master carrot, taking three disciples and going to the west to looking for truth, looking for the true sutra, looking for the sutra carry all the truth, no errors at all. And uh, over the, the on the way, they have experienced many problems: the devils, uh, the spirits, evil spirits. They all try to eat the man, the master, to, and they, they believe is if you eat his flesh, you will have eternal life. What, what, did we, what did they get the idea? That like we, we read in John, it said, my flesh, eat my flesh, my blood, my blood you can drink, my meat you can eat that you can have eternal life. Jesus said that, right? But they took it literally. So they want to eat the flesh of that uh, master. So this is a very famous story. But you can see some more pieces of things right there. And when, and how, how can you get there? So they wrote this. Uh, I have the English translation, so you don't worry too much about it. And one... Uh, this is in a one temple, and a master, uh, you heard about the Shaolin Kung Fu, Shaolin, okay. and Shaolin Temple. This is the fifth, uh, the fourth master was ready to pass on his robe to the next one. So you want to choose one of them to be the next master, next guru. And so he asked him to write a poem to summarize your understanding about the Buddhism. So whosoever wrote the best will be the one. Uh, so one person wrote it. He said, the body is a wisdom tree. Your heart is a stand of mirror. Mirror bright. Frequently wipe it. Don't let it be dusty. That is what. How to get there? It is that you have to clean up your mind, your mirror. That's how you how you go from here to there. Then there was a man who is a cook, who does not read, who does not write. He said, Why, what are you guys doing? He said, oh, the master is choosing someone. Who, everyone is writing a poem. He said, can you write one for me? <laughs> he also wanted to try. And he's, he just came in eight months ago. He was a cook and uh, never really was allowed to chant with other monks for the 
to do the meditation together, but how, what does he know? People was uh, wondering. So he, but he begged them to write for him. So he wrote this one. He said, there is no wisdom tree, nor a stand of mirror bright. Since all is void, all is empty. It's not there. Where can the dust alight? Where would the dust come from? Obviously, the first one is describing human, human nature. The second one is describing divine nature. If we want to use Christian language to describe it. Before God creates everything, there was nothing out there. Nothing is going to pollute the divine nature of God because there was nothing there. He is the creator. Before he creates, nothing exists except himself. So this is a man of just a cook. Have this understanding, and then he wrote. Of course, he was chosen as the guru. And they are trying to, and using this kind of understanding, uh, for Buddhists, and the, one of the things they want to do is you summarize all your belief in a few words. That's what they would like to do. I had the experience uh, witnessing with a group of uh, Buddhists and Taoists, eight of them together. They invited me to a tea, to a house, and then they started to serve tea. And then one man with a long beard, <laughs> and he said, now, since I'm the host and you are the guest, I will start. Let us each summarize your understanding of your own religion in four words only. So he started. He started on Buddhism. He said, I do, I suffer. I do, I get paid. In other in words, you, you, get what you, you get paid by what you do. So the next one is me. And so I said, I do, he suffers. And then the, the, I said, can I say one more? He said, yeah, go ahead. And then I said, he suffers. I saved. Four, four by four. This is just a Chinese, Chinese words. You have to be, you cannot throw out 28 fundamental doctrines. That doesn't work. You have to summarize things you know, in a few words. Wow, that is really a challenge for me. And that, that lead me to, to, to think, man, we have a Bible. We have a Seventh-day Adventist. We have a, the present truth. But how can we tell them in a simple form? in simplicity with clarity. How can we address the issue? Where are we from and where are we going? And tell them in the most, in the simplest form. Or do we really understand ourselves to begin with? So for them, they, they think the Buddha will not save anyone unless they have faith and they are willing. You know, there was one time uh, a scholar invited me to write something, but he already given the title of the book, The Faithless Religion. I said, sir, if you want me to write about Buddhism, they're not faithless. They're based on faith. But he insists. I said, can we change the title? Otherwise, I cannot participate. But he insists uh, Using, seeing all other religions as faceless, which is not true at all. Maybe from the Western scholars' eyes, they don't have faith, but that's not true. Buddhism is based upon faith. And if you don't have faith, they will not help you, or, can, or Buddha cannot help you. Anyway, this is all about uh, Buddhism. And uh, so what I'm do, going to do in the next part is to try to find answers from the Bible to address these three questions. And where are we from and where are we going and how to get there? 
we will do it in a very quick way, since uh, these are very, uh, these are all familiar verses. The Bible in Genesis revealed how man, how man was made and uh, where he came from. And uh, the two verses you can see, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and verse 15. Verse 7 tells us how we came into being. And we were taken out of the dust. And then God put man into a place called the Garden of Eden. That is the place. And when he sinned, then we know that they were driven out of the Garden of Eden. Now, we, one question in the mission field we always hear, we have to deal with, is where, uh, where does man come from? And normally Christians give an answer. Where are you from? We give an answer. We are made, we are created, we are made by God. Hold on, hold, hold a minute. Is that truly the Bible answer? Yes or no? Adam and his wife were created by God. The rest come from your parents. That's biblical. Because when God created Adam and Eve, he seized his creation. He stopped. Then had the Sabbath. He only created two human beings. Then blessed them so that they can have children. So where are we from? We're from our parents, obviously. One day I was driving in Florida. There is a question, where are babies from? From Florida Children's Hospital. That's where they are from. <laughs> so we, this is by observation, that's what it is. But normally we give an answer to say, God made me. That's a lie. Because if you have a perfect God, you have a kind God, you have a, wis a God of wisdom, you look at yourself, you're not that smart. I look at myself, I'm not that smart, I'm not that good looking. Even God made me this way, this product, it's insult to him. So you look at, we take it for granted, we, we simply just say, that's the way how God made us. No, God will create a new creation in you. If anyone in Christ is a new creature, and then when he comes back again, he will give you a new body. That's how he will make you, but not this body. This is not how he made it. This is, this is the one that he, is, he wants to redeem. Uh, but as Christians, you don't read those questions. You don't distinguish between God's creation and how we came because as Christians, we just take it for granted. But when you face Buddhists, they can observe everyone was born from their parents. How can you say you are created by God? Even the Bible teaches the same thing. Be fruitful and multiply. And that's how we got into this place. And the Bible said, you know, the heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. So we, in one way, we come from the, the earth. He given the earth to, the, to man. And then the next, he put them into the Garden of Eden. So he have given them how many portions? Double portions. He created the earth, gave them the earth, and then he placed him into the Garden of Eden. So that's a double portions. We, we talk about the birthright in the Bible. Do we really know what is the birthright? The birthright is you get double portion. What is those double portion? Inherit the earth and also inherit the garden. That's a double portion. And that is why in the Beatitude, Jesus understand, of course. So in the Beatitude, you can see the double portion is mentioned. You will inherit the earth, and also you will inherit the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, double portion. New earth, the same kingdom of God. 
That's a double portion. All will, all in Christ will receive the birthright. Whose birthright to begin with? Adam's birthright. He was the first born. So he was given double portions. All of us who believe in Jesus will share the same thing. But after the fall, things are different. So they were kicking out from the Garden of Eden. So the question is, where are we from? The answer, we are from the Garden of Eden. That's the correct answer, biblically speaking. As soon as man was created, he was placed in the garden. After he sinned, he was kicked out. Where are, where are we from? Originally from the Garden of Eden. That's the biblical answer. How was man, how did we come? Then, then we can say, well, God made it heaven first, then he sinned, and that's how. He got kicked out. So the origin of man, man, was, man came to existence by creation, and his original home was the Garden of Eden. Simple like that. And then if you look at the Garden of Eden, and you can see it's from the east going to the west, going that way. That is giving you some connection about the western blissful world. They are still, in some religions, they still retain the real blessed place is in the west, not to the east. Ellen White wrote about this. She said, after their sin, Adam and Eve were no longer to dwell in Eden. They earnestly entreated that they might remain in the home of their innocent and joy. So Eden was their home. Okay. That is where we as human beings come from. We are all descendants of Eden. In humanity and unalloyable sadness, they bade farewell to their beautiful home and went forth to dwell upon the earth where rested the curse of sin. So where are we from? We're from the Garden of Eden, the original home. And so where are we going? So this is uh, an interesting question. After man came up, was kicking out of Garden of Eden, and Ellen White continued to say, the Garden of Eden remained upon the earth long after man had become an outcast from his pleasant past. The fallen race were long permitted to gaze upon the home of innocence, the entrance barred only by the watching angels. So when they work on the earth, they always see the Garden of Eden. That is their destiny. That is their final destination. That is where they need to go. They need to return. That is the only kingdom that saves. Why? Because there is a tree of life in it. All other kingdoms cannot save because there's no vaccines for COVID-19. Whatever that is. The only Vaccines is the tree of life. It will heal all the diseases. That is the only kingdom that will save. And they use the her look at the word, the home, the Eden, then she continued to use the word, at the cherubim guarded the gate of paradise, the divine glory was revealed. So the Garden of Eden is the original home. It is also called the paradise. And it is to the same place they come to the Eden, to the front of the Eden. They cannot enter anymore, but they come to the gate of the Eden to have their worship. Not only Adam, but also his sons. So they all come here to worship. But when the flood came, and Eden was withdrawn from the earth. My son uh, liked to use Eden as the embassy. Eden was the embassy God sent to this earth. But when heaven, the earth, was in big conflict, what do you do? You call back your ambassador. But if, humanly speaking, we have the technology, we would move back the embassy. But we don't have that technology. So we let the embassy stay, but only call back the ambassador. That's normally what happens on this earth. 
And when the flood, the time the sin really multiplied, God called back, took back this embassy, and took back Eden. It is withdrawn from the earth. But he will uh, restore it. It is, it is to be restored more gloriously than at the beginning. Now, where are we going? And uh, this is in this is a garden that those who are keeping the commandment will be bringing back to this garden, and is kept on earth. Now, we in uh, Revelation, it given the promises that. Like in chapter 2, it said, To him that overcomes what I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Which paradise? Of course, is the Garden of Eden. In the middle of that garden, you can find the tree of life. And again, in chapter 22, it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and it may enter in through the gates into the city. Now notice, the tree of life is outside of the city. You get to the tree of life first, then you enter into the city. You get that picture in your mind? The city, before the city, it was the tree of life. And God, Adam and Eve sinned, in the city, then they were kicked out. When they were kicked out, God prevented them from eating the tree of life, and they sent angels to block the way. And uh, Eden has been here, it is the only destination human know when Eden was here. The only purpose for Adam and all the humanity is to go back because only there you can charge your battery. Nowhere else has a plug. This is the only place. But the sinner gradually lost this hope. And Cain was the first one. He says, Cain had gone out from the presence of the Lord, cast away the promise of the restored Eden. Cain lost it. But Abel kept it. Abel who had led a pastoral life, dwelt in the tents, and uh, he, just like believing, counting themselves as strangers and the pilgrims. But for Abel, he saw the Garden of Eden on earth. But for the descendant later, like the Hebrew would say, all oh, they died in faith, not having received the promises. Ellen White quoted Hebrews, quoting the Hebrews, saying that the city that God prepared, and he used that, to apply, she used it to apply to Abel. Actually, that city is called the city, the heavenly, is none other than the one that's taken from the earth. One day it will come back. You know, after the flood, Noah was put into the ark, and we, I just had the privilege recently visited the Ark Encounter in Kentucky. It was a life-size, I think it was very impressive. When we walked in, they, have, they are singing their theme song. The, the world was, create, was created in six literal days. On the seventh day, God rested, made it as a Sabbath. They sing that song to all the visitors. They believe the six literal days I hope someone will have the opportunity to tell them. The Sabbath day is also literal. Please keep it. <laughs> but somehow they, they, they set that apart. Now, when Noah came out, out of the flood, and he must be horrified. You have a tornado here once in a while. After the tornado, if your house, the trees are knocked down, how do you feel? Horrified. And when he came out, look at the whole world. It was so beautiful before, and now what happened? He must be scared. In order to pacify him, God put the rainbow 
in the sky. I never really put the connection to that. I raised a question to myself, how, how would it, why he sees the rainbow, then he, he become peaceful? There is a hope. Was that his first time to see the rainbow, or he had seen it before? In 1995, I had an experience. I, for some reason, I, it would be another story. I escaped out of China, landed in Hong Kong. Now, Hong Kong is a legally governed society. So as an illegal immigrant, in a way, <laughs> I have to be sent into a detention center, armed with six so, uh, policemen armed with machine guns and the whatever rifles or whatever that is. That was my first time be sitting in the prisons, prisoners van with all the police with guns. I was terrified. It took about half an hour to drive from the immigration building to the detention center. Together with me was another doctor. But on the way, I tried to say, Let's not, not look at the policeman because it's scary. I saw a rainbow outside all the way through. It was a shiny day, no rain at all. So I asked the doctor, the doctor said, where, where? The doctor couldn't see it. But I saw it all the way through, half an hour. It just got my attention. I said, I, I, with me was a Bible. It, it allowed me to carry the Bible into the detention center. I said, I need to find out what is the rainbow in the Bible. So I found, I found, of course, the Noah story. I, I know that one. But that doesn't really help me much. What would bring comfort to Noah if that's the first time he saw it? It wouldn't be. You must have seen something that always brings comfort to you. Then when you see it again, you feel good. But where did he see it before? Now in, in Ezekiel chapter 1, it says, as the appearance of the ball that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So the rainbow is, is nothing else but it's just the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Whenever, wherever the glory of the Lord is revealed, you see a rainbow. But where could, did, could Noah have seen it before? Look, let's read it again. At the gate of the cherubim guarded the gate of paradise, the divine glory was revealed. So in another words, whenever the Lord appeared, to the Garden of Eden. The beholders outside of the garden can see at the gate of the Garden of Eden the divine glory. What does that look like? A rainbow. Noah was 600 years old. He has seen it for 600 years, the rainbow. But that it was when the garden was on earth. Now the garden is gone. No more rainbow there. So God says, let me still put it in the sky. So that will remind you the rainbow, the glory that you have seen for 600 years. So he has seen it. And it is the same way that we, we see that the, in Revelation, you see God, you see the throne, you see the rainbow. Because that, was his, that is his glory. That's the shape of his glory. It looks like a rainbow. That's what it is. And to me, for the, as Adventist, it's even making more sense, meaningful, the message that comes from the angel, Revelation 10. And over his head, is, there is also a rainbow. He's coming direct, the message, the authority coming directly from the throne of God. That is what started this movement. The rainbow message and that is the age when the Garden of Eden was on earth. That is the time the people have great knowledge of God. 
No one can deny the existence of God because the garden is right there. The rainbow appears. And Ellen White continued to wrote, she said, and the, the, the glory of God was revealed, and hence comes the first worshipers. And it was right in this place that the quiet witness of the Garden of Eden witnessed the glory, the wisdom, the love of God. No one can deny that. But now it's all gone. Even Cain and Abel brought their sacrifices to the gate of the Eden. Now in your, in your imagination, you can start to see what that is. And when it is no, no longer on us, God still wants to restore the knowledge of God on us. So he did something. He called the people, like Abraham, like Adam, and he sent him to a place. Adam was sent to a place. So Abraham was called and then sent to a place. And then he wanted to reproduce the Garden of Eden on earth. So he said, make me a sanctuary. So that this is my people. This is a light of knowledge of the love of God. It can still go out just like as if the garden was still on earth. So he modeled it. He said, make a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And the sacrifice goes, is sitting at the eastern gate of the holy place. Adam, his sons, brought the sacrifice to the eastern gate of the Garden of Eden. What do you think? What is the Eden? That's where the first sacrifice, that sacrifice is being held for Six, 1,600 years, 1,600 years, right before the gate of Garden of Eden. That age, remember, that is the only place, that's the final destination of humanity. That's where you go. America only have 200 some years of history. You, you would remember the White House is where the president lives, works. But for 1,600 years, that is the place people go and worship. That is the place that people go to sacrifice. And then they forgot all about it, including Christian world. We forgot all about it. We started with Abraham. Forgot about before Abraham, there was another 2,000 years history. Nothing starts from Abraham. And then it was the, uh, alongside of the, the sanctuary, you have the 12 tribes. And four directions. Why four tribes? It is a model. If you look at the Garden of Eden, it says from the garden there are how many rivers? Four. If it's four rivers, tell me, is the Garden of Eden flat or is this a high mountain? Many artists draw it as it's flat. No common sense. How can water become big river on a flat land? Doesn't work. It has to be a high mountain. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountain. Which mountain is that? The Garden of Eden. That is the, where the throne of God is. That is where his glory is. That is from that mountain, four rivers flow into four directions. So the sanctuary remodeled after that and also placed the 12 tribes on four directions, indicating when, if there is a river, that's where you have people. Four river, four directions. And of course, the Garden of Eden. It is a place, it's not simply a garden. It is a place, it's a congress. It is a place that the law of God was legislated. It is in the Garden of Eden God made a marriage institution. It is in the Garden of Eden he rested and hallowed the Sabbath. It is a, he is a lawmaker and the garden is where the law was made. Also, the judgment 
was conducted in that garden. And the sanctuary, the, the sanctuary is for the main purpose to keep the law. I appreciate Dr. Atreya, his book, especially he talked about the name of God. He talked about what place the name in the place, and that is the most holy place. The sanctuary become holy simply because his holy law, his name. And the Garden of Eden is the place, make the law, execute the judgment, and that's where his people lives, lived. Now, did the Bible ever call the Garden of Eden a sanctuary? Because we as a church, we understand we are, especially this is my issue when I wrestle with in the mission field, we have a complicated sanctuary message. But we fail to answer two questions. Why the sanctuary is in heaven? How did it get there? We never explained that one. Secondly, after Jesus, our message ends, we say Jesus is now in the most holy place, is doing the investigative judgment when he comes out at the second coming. But after we, he come out, how are we related to that sanctuary? We have no answer. We, we don't go there. So in a way, our message, as popular as it is preached, it didn't quite get to the point where, what exactly is that? How did it make it to heaven? And after the second coming, how are we related to that sanctuary? We just don't, don't talk about it. Now, in Ezekiel, actually, it says, you were in Eden. Now, Eden does not come into existence because the world was made. Eden was there when Lucifer was first created, the garden of God. Eden was originally in heaven. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. And he was walking into that great mountain. And then continue to say that you were in the Eden of a God, the garden of a garden, and they said, you have defiled the thy sanctuaries. It, can, it says, this garden, you defiled this garden by your sins. And uh, it is this one that is being taken away from earth that God wants to bring it back. And we, in the, in the Bible, I studied the Bible, but my challenge is, how am I going to relate the Bible to the Buddhist or the Hindus or the Chinese? Make it simple. The Bible starts from the Garden of Eden and then transit to the sanctuary. And then when it comes to the New Testament, it went into the kingdom of heaven and then closed with the new Jerusalem. How am I going to tell them all these different names? Are these the same or different? or exactly one and the same thing. Now, when you come to Jesus, he taught the prayer, the center of the prayer is thy kingdom comes, because the kingdom is now taken away. It's not on earth anymore. And his, the center of his gospel is, uh, he's talking about the kingdom of God is at hand. His center message is the kingdom of God. He, Parables. He got seven parables talking about the kingdom of God. That's his center. So what exactly is that kingdom? And even before he ends, he said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole inhabiting the earth for a testimony to all nations. Then shall the end will be come. Uh, will come. So, Definitely, the, the gospel is a kingdom gospel. It's about the kingdom. But we need to understand what is that kingdom. And even after his resurrection, he's also talking about the kingdom. He spent 40 days speaking about the kingdom of God. So the message shifted from garden to the sanctuary, the temple, now in the New Testament, the kingdom of God. So we need to raise a question. Where did Jesus go? Exactly. 
Well, he said himself, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. So he's going to his father's house. But he also said, that is a place he go to prepare a place. Well, what, is, what does that mean to prepare a place? It's simple. Have you ever received a guest to your house? What do you do to prepare your house? Do the cleaning, right? Do the cleaning. To, to prepare a place is to cleanse the sanctuary. That's what it is. To have it cleansed so that he can receive guests. And in Hebrew said he went to heaven in the city in the true tabernacle, in the heavenly sanctuary. And Hebrew 8 and 9 talks about the same thing. But Jesus remembered there's one more thing that Jesus said where he's going. He said, I am going to the paradise. He talked to the thief on the cross. We normally focus to, to say this is not to say Jesus went the same day. There's no immortality of the soul. When you die, the soul does not go. But, but we forgot about the place. Jesus said, you shall be with me in where? In paradise. So he is going to the paradise. He is going to the paradise where the tree of life is. He is going to the garden of Eden. He is going to the place that's taken from the earth and kept in heaven. That's where he went. So where did Jesus go? My father's house, paradise, sanctuary. They are the same place. He only went to one place. But this place is called by different names. So what is the purpose of Jesus entering into the most holy place? I mean, I have this message about the sanctuary. We start in 1844, he started to have investigative judgment. And then what is the purpose of it? Daniel 17, 7, uh, 13, and 14 told 13 talking about Jesus was taken to the most holy place. Verse 14 talking about the purpose. There was given him dominion and glory and this kingdom. He, that was the purpose. That is the purpose why he, he went. The investigative judgment was not the purpose why he went. It is a process leading to this result. He have to go through a process. But the purpose is to give him the dominion, glory, and the kingdom. It is this kingdom that is everlasting. That's also another reason why that we have an everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel we are preaching is to proclaim that the kingdom of grace is coming to an end. The kingdom, the everlasting kingdom of glory is on the way. It is from 1844 we start to proclaim to the world, it's coming to an end, it's coming to an end. The everlasting kingdom is on the way. Try to get into that. Now, that's what I'm saying. Let's just look at what Ellen White talks about. Ellen White, all along, she understands perfectly what is the purpose of the investigative judgment. In Great Controversy, chapter 28, paragraph 14, I will just read the, the, the part highlighted. It says, divine intercessor presents the plea that all who have be overcome through faith in his blood be forgiven their transgressions, that is, cleansing of the sanctuary, that they be restored to their Eden home. What is the purpose of going through this investigative judgment? and the cleansing of the sanctuary, so that these people, those people whose sin are forgiven, cleansed, they will be restored to what? To their Eden home. And in chapter 17, she said, one of the most solemn and yet most glorious truths revealed in the Bible is that of the Christ's second coming to complete the great work of redemption. We talk about we are the Seventh-day Adventists, but what is the purpose of the second coming? What is it? The purpose of the second coming, using the word of Ellen White, 
The doctrine of the second advent is a very keynote of the sacred scriptures. From the day when the first pair turned their soaring steps from Eden, the children of faith have waited the coming of the promised one to break the destroyer's power and bring them back again to the lost paradise. That is the purpose. The second coming is the purpose of the second coming is to bring Adam and all his descendants to the Garden of Eden. And holy men of old looked forward to the event of the Messiah in the glory as the consummation of their hope because the day would come. That's the final destination is to step into the city to go back to the tree of life and the second coming will fulfill that. That is the purpose of the second coming. And we have this promise. We read that before Revelation chapter 2 to the ear who Whosoever have an ear, basically everyone. You, if you can listen, then listen. To those who are overcome, they will have, have the a privilege to eat the tree of life. And after the resurrection, where would people go? Well, Ellen White wrote in the same chapter, same book, Great Controversy, when the rants and the ones are welcome to the city of God. We have to understand what is the city of God. We have many hymns saying the New Jerusalem, this, but never realize what is New Jerusalem. And she said that city is the Eden home from which Adam was so long being exiled. That is the city of God. The city of God is none other than the Garden of Eden. The sanctuary was modeled after the city, after the Garden of Eden. And, uh, and Adam, he comprehends that this is indeed Eden restored. That is the heaven. That is the kingdom of God he tried to enter. That's what it is. So the kingdom of God, the sanctuary, the Garden of Eden, the New Jerusalem, they're all one and the same place, the Garden of Eden. That's all the same thing. And the great mountain, the holy mountain, the sacred Zion, all of this referring to the same place. And the Savior, they are standing in the paradise of God. So this, so we can see this is truly the, Ellen White is super clear from the beginning of per, per, uh, Patriarch and Prophet to the end of great controversy for her. The sanctuary is the Garden of Eden is clear, clear as daylight all the way through. But I wonder why we did it. We miss it sometimes. We present the sanctuary message, make it so complicated to the degree, to the point that we don't even know what that it is. You come from the Garden of Eden. To the Garden of Eden, you go back. The Tree of Life is there in the Garden of Eden. Without going to the Tree of Life, you die. Simple like that. And the Revelation chapter 21 even said the new Jerusalem actually it is what? It's a tabernacle of God. It's a sanctuary of God. That's the new Jerusalem. Using the word, the new Jerusalem is indeed the sanctuary. And you compare the words I make a sanctuary so I can dwell among them. And then eventually the new Jerusalem come down, God dwell among men. Wasn't that Jerusalem is a sanctuary? Yes, it's, it is indeed. And let's just uh, close with a few Adventist pioneers on standing. And you will see that we didn't go very far. They have all understood this very well, but somehow we just backwards. We, got, we lost this understanding. We made it so complicated, and yet we don't even know what that is. James White said, therefore it is clear that Old, Testament, Old Jerusalem is temple and the furniture of that temple have distinct anatypes in what? In paradise. He understands it. 
He understands very clearly the heavenly sanctuary is none other than the paradise. It was getting there is because of the flood. That is also because the, the, the foundation taken away from the earth, so the flood is not only water, the continent moves because of no more foundation. Paradise was taken up from the earth after the fall of man is plain, as there is no such place on earth which answers the description of it given by Moses. So to James White, very clear. Let's look at another one. J. N. Andrews. Beyond this time of trouble, we just read the highlighted part. The paradise of God, and he said, is a, his glorious sanctuary, he said, is the temple. Andrews understand it. The temple of God, the sanctuary of God, and the paradise are one and the same thing. No problem with that. Let's look at Ellen White. Ellen White saying the whole plan of salvation, the plan of salvation is that where they might, through the merits of his blood, find pardon for the past transgressions and by obedience be brought back to the garden from which they were driven. Something like that. So the plan of salvation is for one purpose, so man can be restored to the Garden of Eden. And it's the same way that, uh, just from different places, that the, a way was given, was opened, so that man can be restored to his favor and be brought back to their Eden home. This is the whole purpose of the plan of salvation. Now, Ellen White wrote, I believe the sanctuary to be cleansed at the end of 2300 days is the new Jerusalem temple of which Christ is a minister. The new Jerusalem is the heavenly sanctuary. The new Jerusalem is the city. In the middle of that city is found the tree of life. And wherever you find the tree of life, that's the garden of Eden. So all of them are very, very clear. And, and she's, uh, she wrote that when we come, when we finally Christ will bring us back, and she said, before the ransomed throne is the holy city. Jesus opens wide the pearly gates and the nations that they ca kept the truth enter in. There they behold, what? The paradise of God. The home of Adam in his innocency. Then that voice, richer than any music that ever fell on mortal ear, is heard saying, your conflict is ended. Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What kingdom was that? That was prepared for men to live from the foundation of the world. Of course, there was only one the Garden of Eden. So what is, that ends our Bible answers to the questions that the people in the mission field, they want to know, where are we coming from? We come from the Garden of Eden. Where are we going? We go back to the Garden of Eden. How can we get back? Through Jesus. He is the only way. Father, we thank you for your word. The answers are simple, but sometimes we get lost in our own logic and by different terminologies. But your plan, your word, the inspiration you're given is so clear. Let us make the truth in simplest term and bring that to the mission field to the souls of the thousands of Gentiles. In Jesus' name, amen.
Welcome back. Our topic this meeting is Satan's ultimate weapon. Satan's ultimate weapon. I enjoy history. By studying history, we understand people's behavior. We understand what happens when it repeats again by watching what has happened in the past. There was a tremendous war. And Satan was trying to figure out how to get God back. He'd been kicked out of heaven. What would he do? How could he get God back? And he gathered all of his angels together and said, we got to figure a plan. And finally, Satan himself came up with a plan. Let me share this plan with you. It comes from the book Temperance. Satan gathered his fallen angels together to devise some way of doing the most possible evil to the human family. The most possible evil to the human family. One suggestion after another was made, till finally Satan himself thought of a plan. He would take the fruit of the vine, also wheat, and other things given by God as food, and would convert them into poison, which would ruin man's physical, mental, and moral powers, and so overcome the senses that Satan should have full control. You know, if you're trying to figure out <clears throat> how to protect yourself from an enemy, you want to find out what weapons the enemy has. You know, do they, you know, the Japanese had an 18-inch gun on one of their battleships. America only had a 16-inch gun. You want to find out how fast are their missiles, how, you know, what can your missiles do to shoot down their missiles? Y'all, we're in a war. We're in the greatest war there's ever been, the Great Controversy. And y'all, this war is coming to a climax, but it started back in those days. Yes, it started in heaven. As we see, Christ won that war. And he kicked Satan and his fallen angels out of heaven. But when they came back to this earth, when they came down here, they tried to figure out how they would take out God's plan for humanity. And let's look at Satan's plan again so that we better understand how to Protect ourselves. Again, Satan's ultimate weapon. He would take the fruit of the vine, also wheat, and other things given by God as food, food, and would convert them into poisons, which would ruin man's physical, mental, and moral powers, and so overcome the senses that Satan should have full control. I'd like to look at Satan's MO, his method of operation. When you're trying to figure out what is a person going to do, you look at their history. Does a person have a pattern? Or are they just all over the place? If you're dealing with a person, how would that person potentially work in that situation? I remember years ago, I had a lady, and her job, I was working at a clinic outside of Washington, D.C., and her job was solely with the State Department to study Putin, the president of Russia. That's all she did. She studied to know exactly how this man would react and would report it straight to the Secretary of State of state. See, if we'd understand Putin, we'd better understand how he would react if something may happen. Well, we need to understand what is Satan's method of operation. Is there a threat of consistency? I believe there is, as we'll find out today. As we do our intelligence, our research of history, is there a super weapon that he has or has used to destroy humanity? Let's take a look. 
Let's look at Genesis. Let's look at the very beginning and see if we can find this weapon. Turn with me. Turn with me to Genesis 3.1. Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. Now why did Satan appear as a serpent and not as himself? Because he came in disguise. You know, Adam and Eve had been warned that there was an enemy. They figured they knew the story. They knew the story about the, the war in heaven. They were not expecting a snake. They were expecting a, Satan, one of the fallen angels, to be there to watch for. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53, paragraph 4. In order to accomplish his work unperceived, Satan chose to employ as his median the serpent, a disguise well adapted for his purpose of deception. The serpent was then one of the wisest and most beautiful creatures on the earth. Now today, we don't think of snakes being wise. We've got copperheads and rattlesnakes and water moccasins and different snakes that might be poisonous. Or we got the garter snake and the black snake and the black indigo. But we don't identify them as the wisest. At that time they were. The serpent was then one of the wisest and most beautiful creatures on the earth. It had wings. And while flying through the air presented an appearance of dazzling brightness, having the color of brilliancy of burnished gold, resting in the rich laden branches of the forbidden tree, and regaling itself on the delicious fruit, it was an object to arrest the attention and delight the eye of the beholder. Thus, in the garden of peace lurked the destroyer watching for his prey. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Is this what God had said? Turn with me to chapter 2, verse 15. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden and dressed it to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, therefore thou shalt surely die. Let's go back to chapter 3. And the woman said to the, unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Was this a lie? It sure was. We're beginning the issue of lying. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as gods, and no good in evil, equal to God. And when, the summons, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Now what was it now? Let's look at it again. Let's study. <clears throat> and when the woman saw that the tree was Good for food. It was pleasant to the eye. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. Good for food. Pleasant to the eyes. Make one wise. She took the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. Now, was Adam with her when she was speaking with the serpent? Let's see. Let's look at Patriarchs and Prophets. P 
page 53, paragraph 3. And the angel had cautioned Eve to beware of separating herself from her husband while occupying in their daily labor in the garden. And with him, she would be less in less danger from temptation than if she were alone. Now, is that true today? Is that true if we're with our spouse? We're less prone to be in danger. If we're someone else, are we less prone to be in danger? Absolutely. How did Jesus send the disciples out? Two by two. But absorbed, now let's take a look. Did she leave Adam with intent? Or was there not intent? Let's see what it says. But absorbed in the pleasing task, she unconsciously, unconsciously wandered from his side. So she did not leave Adam with intent. She was working in the garden. He was working in the garden, working. And she unconsciously walked away from him. But then what happened? On perceiving that she was alone, she felt an apprehension of danger. So she knew there could be a problem now. She had stepped away from her husband, out of the safety of two. Now she feels possible danger. Do you ever do that? Do you ever start to do something and, and something says, you know, Walt, you better not be doing that. That's the issue. What do you do with that thought? Do you go back into safety or you do what Eve did? She dismissed her fears. On perceiving that she was alone, she felt an apprehension of danger, but she dismissed her fears. Do you ever do that? I got it. I'm in control. I mean, Eve and Adam were humans. You had the animals who had charge over the, the humans had charge over the animals. I mean, they were in control. We got it. Or maybe. She dismissed her fears, deciding that she had sufficient wisdom and strength to discern evil and to withstand it. Do you ever do that? Do you ever say, it's okay, I can handle it? Unmindful of the angel's caution, she soon found herself gazing with mindful curiosity and admiration upon the forbidden tree. Great Controversy, page, uh, uh, Great Controversy, page 531, paragraph 2. Employing as his medium the serpent, then a creature of fascinating appearance, he, he addressed himself to Eve. Eve, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Had Eve refrained from entering into argument with the tempter, she would have been safe. You and I would not be sitting here today. Over. Done. But what happened? What did she do? Does Satan learn from our human thinking? He does. Have you ever seen someone who knows how to push somebody's buttons? Have you ever watched that? They'll go, oh, watch here. Watch, watch here. I'm going to get him. And they'll go and say something to somebody and just send them to the moon. Satan does that. Had Eve refrained from entering into argument with the tempter, she would have been safe. But she ventured to what? She ventured to parley with him and fell victim to his wiles. Has someone ever come up and, and tempted you? Said something that made you upset? Say it said something that was just plumb wrong? And sometime you just, you just got to get them back. I'll set them straight right now, right fast. She parleyed with him. 
if he had started talking, snakes don't talk. She knew that. If she had left right then and gone back to Adam, she would have been safe. There's many times someone that might be close, someone that may not be close, decides to get your goat. If you'll just walk away, you'll be a whole lot safer than saying something or doing something that you just might regret later. It is thus that many are still overcome. Does that mean Satan's still doing it today? They doubt and argue concerning requirements of God, and instead of obeying the divine commands, they accept human theories, which but disguise the devices of Satan. Do we see that today? This happens so often with our medical community. The today understood science is chosen over the Word of God when it comes to health reform. And you may say, well, you know, we need to do this. Nah, science says this, Walt. Huh. Have we seen science go 180 degrees? Just saw it last week. We saw science go 180 degrees last week on what the main thought on a, subject, a certain topic was. And the CDC said, oh, no, we were wrong. 180 degrees wrong. God's Word is much more solid than any science that man may come up with. If God says do it, do it. Let's go back. Chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and that the tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them were both opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves, fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Was Satan correct that their eyes would be open? Absolutely, but not exactly the way he identified. What were the consequences? Let's go to chapter 3, verse 14. Ch Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, <clears throat> Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. Thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, no longer being able to fly, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. That was a consequence to snakes. Now, what do you say to Satan? And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, what did, he say to, what did he say to Eve? And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Is childbirth painful? I've been there for three. Absolutely. I'm glad Mary Lou had to go through that, not me. Yes, I was there, but she's the one that went through that pain. Why? It went all the way back to disobedience in the garden. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy con uh, conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband. And thy, de and thou, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Very clear. Who's responsible? Who's the priest of the, ha phone, of the home? And to Adam, here's what he said to Adam. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, 
In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. What Adam did is that Adam chose to follow the voice of his wife instead of following the voice of God. <clears throat> now there's something else very, very serious here. I believe history will repeat itself. We're told in the end that in the last days, the last events will be a time as never before. Daniel 12, 1. <clears throat> it's going to be worse than the genocide in Rwanda. It's going to be worse than the Reformation. It's going to be worse than the time of Christ. It's going to be worse than the time of the flood. It's going to be worse than the Holocaust. It's going to be the worst of ever. Does Satan learn from human behavior? He does. So what happened here? Did Adam fall for the, to be wise, for the look of the, uh, of the fruit or be like God's? No. He was not tempted by that. What took Adam down? You may think that you have a great love affair with your spouse. But I tell you, the best love affair ever was in the Garden of Eden. There was no sin. It was the best love affair. Eve loved Adam. Adam loved Eve. And when Eve came to him, with a bite out of that fruit, Adam knew that his wife was going to die. And what did Adam do? He had a choice. What Adam did, I call suicide. We're told in inspiration that Adam identified that his wife was going to die. And it says that he chose his love for his wife, who he felt he could not do without, over his love for God. That's the bottom line. That is what happened to Adam. He chose his love for his wife over his love for God. Well, Satan used that again. I was talking with my, my aunt last night, and we were talking about end time events. We look at the Reformation. She just read Great Controversy again. <clears throat> and it was talking about the Waldensians and what happened there. What faith those people had. How strong they were. Do you have that faith? Are you that strong? Adam wasn't. Adam chose his love for his wife over his love for Christ. It's all based on relationship. Bottom line, the stronger the relationship, who do you have a stronger relationship with? Your spouse or Christ? Will it happen in the end? Will Satan use this ploy? I believe he will. I believe that parents who are about to watch their children get killed, parents who are about to watch their spouse be killed, they will not obey God's word. Are you willing to, to stay strong for Christ? Or are you going to go down because of your children and your spouse? And that's what Satan is hoping. How do we prepare for that? How do you prepare for your children being killed, your spouse being killed? As we talked last night, my aunt and I, you don't prepare for that. It is only through a, re a relationship with Christ that you have a chance to be strong. And you don't just develop a relationship with somebody at the last minute. I have a relationship with my children, a relationship with my spouse, but it's taken years to develop. Start working on your relationship with Christ. Not in the morning, in the evening. We're talking all day long. 
Walk with him. Talk with him. Get to know him. It is that relationship that will hold you through the end. Did Satan's plan work? Why was there a tree of good and evil? Why did Adam and Eve have to be subjected to Satan? Like the angels, the dwellers in Eden had to be placed upon probation. Like the angels, they had just gone through this war. Like the angels, the dwellers in Eden had to be placed upon probation. When people join the fire department, they are put on a 60-day probation. They can't vote. They can't have a... There's a number of things they can't do. When you go to work for a company, many times you're put on a, a, a three-month probation, a six-month probation. You understand that. Like the angels, the dwellers in Eden, Adam and Eve, had to be placed upon probation. Their happy estate could be retained only in condition of fidelity to the Creator's law. Obedience. They could obey and what? See, the Bible is very, God is very um, conditional. He doesn't demand us to do something. He doesn't require us to do something. He allows us freedom of choice. But here's the situation. They could obey and live or disobey and perish. Very serious. Is that true today? Absolutely. We can either obey God's law today and live eternally or we can obey what we want to do and perish. God had made them the recipients of rich blessings, but should they disregard His will, He who spared not the angels that sinned, these guys, could not spare them, Adam and Eve. Transgression would forfeit His gifts and bring upon them misery and ruin. Let's put it in here. Transgression would forfeit God's gifts and bring upon you and me misery and ruin. The tree of knowledge had been made a test of their obedience and their love to God. Two things. Their obedience, did they do what He told them? And it was a test of of love. You'll see in this lesson that those two things is what it comes to at the very end. You and I are going to have to overcome in both of those two tests. If we want eternity with Jesus, we have to overcome the test of obedience and we have to overcome the test of love. Love for Christ or love of self. You know, there's, there's a new diagnosis out there. It's only been out a few years. And the psychiatrist came up with it. And it's, it's when a person takes a selfie more than three times a day. The psychiatrists say, that's just not right. And the diagnosis is called selfitis. Selfitis, inflammation of self. Itis is inflammation. So that person has an inflammation of self. Have you seen it? Have you seen them out there? I just got back from Africa and I saw Africans doing this. Yeah, it's all over the world. Satan had 
Selfitis. It's not a new diagnosis. See, prior to Satan falling, heaven was love. We were told in, in uh, Desire of Ages. But then when Satan chose to start thinking of what he wanted to do, the disease of selfitis began. And it began to be self, not love. The tree of knowledge had been made a test of their obedience and love and their love to God. The Lord had seen fit to lay upon them but one prohibition as to the use of all that was in the garden. But if they should disregard his will in this particular, they would incur the guilt of transgression, consequences. Satan was not to follow them with continual temptations. He could have access to them only at the forbidden tree. That's it. In that huge garden, the only place that Satan had, had access to them was there at the tree. Should they attempt to investigate its nature, they would be exposed to his wiles. What test of their obedience did God use? We're told it is appetite. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 11, verse 4. Numbers chapter 11, verse 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? Now what had happened is the children of Israel had left Egypt. They're wandering in the wilderness. And what did they have for food? God gave them manna, angel food but they got tired of it. It's interesting as I work with people, there's a gentleman, there's, a, there's a, a protocol I use for people who have gastrointestinal issues and it's a certain soup, very, very effective. The phytochemicals that God put in this soup are phenomenal in, he in healing the stomach and the intestines. This man came to me recently with ulcerative colitis. His doctor was, you know, about to lower the boom on him. So he came, Walt, is there anything I can do? Yes, there is. So I gave him a diet of this soup. It's very, very effective. You need to do it for 21 days. Just 21 days. Eat this soup. I can do that, he said. He called me the next day. Well, I can't do this soup. <clears throat> no way. There's not enough flavor in this soup. You've got to give me something else to eat. I cannot just eat this soup. He had a choice. How bad did he hurt? I understand he, where he was because I had the same condition. My doctor told me I was going to die unless they took my colon out. It was so bad. There's no intact tissue on the, on the inside of the colon. It was so bad. So when my doctor that I went to said, Walt, I think we can save your colon if you'll eat this soup. Yes, we did some other things, aloe vera and, car uh, and um, uh, we did uh, uh, carob powder and some other things. I was glad to eat that soup. Yes, it got a little boring, but let me tell you, you have severe ulcerative colitis. It's not good. The pain is terrible awful. I was willing to eat that soup, stay on that soup, so that I did not have the situation. This man calls me the next day and he says, no, you got to give me something else. I'm not willing to change my taste. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is, drived, uh, is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. Angel food. Not angel cake. Angel food. What the angels eat. 
They weren't happy with it. They missed that oral stimulation on their tongue. In this instance, the Lord gave the people that which was not for, I'm sorry, in this instance, in this instance, the Lord gave the people that which was not for their best good. Did he do that with king? Yeah. They said, oh, we don't want you to be a king, our king. We want an earthly king like everybody else. Okay, if that's what you want, here you got. Here you go, and here's the consequences. In this instance, the Lord gave the people that which was not good for uh, their best good because they would have it. They would not submit to receive from the Lord those things which would prove for their good. They gave themselves up to seditious murmuring against Moses and against the Lord because they did not receive those things which would prove an injury to them. Their, depri their deprived appetites controlled them. Does your deprived appetite control you? It's interesting as I work with people. And they go and they eat whatever, pizza or whatever they may be eating. And they say, it's worth it. I remember one day, Dr. J.J. Gordino, a, um, a, a nephrologist, came to me and he said, Mr. So-and-so uh, is not doing well. A renal patient on dialysis. He said, Mr. So-and-so is, he's eating fried chicken. And fried chicken just doesn't, doesn't work well with dialysis. He says, please tell Mr. So-and-so if he continues eating the chicken, I don't, his labs, I don't think he's going to live past a month. But if he quits the chicken, there's a good chance that he may get a good six months in. So I went to this gentleman. His wife happened to be there. I said, Mr. So-and-so, uh, Dr. Godino uh, identified you're eating chicken. <clears throat> Here's the consequences. It's your choice. This man looked at his wife, and she said, it's whatever you want to do. I'm going to keep eating the chicken. I want to die happy. And J.J. was right. This man died in less than a month. Their depraved appetites control them. Does ice cream control you? Does the Dr. Pepper, the Mountain Dew, the Coca-Cola, the donuts control you? And God gave them flesh meat, and they desire, and as they desired, and He let them suffer the results of gratifying their lustful appetites. Do we see that today? Do we? I have so often people come into me with diabetes, a lot. Because we're able to help a lot of people with diabetes. And they go and tell folks, go see these folks. They can help you with your diabetes. And so their friends come in and, and I'll say, okay, what do you eat? Now, in the South, we fry everything. Maters, taters, ice cream, okra, um, pigs, chickens. If we can fry it, we fry it. And so I'll say, you need to change your diet to this. I'm not going to quit eating my fried chicken. I'm not going to quit eating my bacon or hog jowl. I can't help you. And they'll storm out upset. Why? Their depraved appetites control them. Burning fevers cut down the very large numbers of the people. Those who had been mostly guilty in their murmurings were slain as soon as they tasted of the meat for which they had lusted. I mean, right then, we'll see how quick it was. If they had submitted to have the Lord select their food for them and had been thankful and satisfied to the, for the food which they could eat freely of without injury, they would not have lost favor with God 
then been punished for their rebellious murmuring by great numbers of them, uh, I'm sorry, by great numbers of them being slain. Councils and Diet and Foods, 377, paragraph 3. I had a lady come in one time. And her son was six years old, and he had asthma, really bad. And she came in, and she says, do you have a healthy pill for him? And I ask her, does he eat this or this or this? And she says, oh, yes. I said, I have found in research, and personally, I used to have full-blown asthma. And when I cut this specific item out, it went away. And I've been without it. Now I've been without asthma for 20 years. But at that time, it had been a while. The doctor that I'd gone to for the ulcerative colitis also told me if I would do this, it would get rid of the asthma, and it did. And she said, no way. I'm not going to deprave my child of ice cream, of cheese, and of milk. I said, I'm not saying ice cream, cheese, and milk is the only cause of asthma, but it's something to rule out and see if it's a cause. No, I'm not willing to do that. So many parents come to me and they say, well, my children eat this certain way. There's nothing I can do about it. Yes, there is. Are they eating breakfast at your house? Yes. Are they eating the noon meal at your house? You know, if they're not in school right now, they're not in school, but I say they're in school. Yeah. Do they eat supper in your house? Yeah. Do they eat food on the weekends in your house? Yeah. Are you their parent? Yeah, then you control what they eat. Are you the one that buys the food? Yeah. Now, yes, if they go to Johnny's house, and, but in your house, control what they eat, just like you control what they watch on television or whatever, hopefully. If they had submitted to have the Lord select their food for them and have been thankful and satisfied for food which they could eat freely of without injury, they would not have lost favor with God. What you allow your children to eat can determine their health, y'all. And even more than that, more serious than that, what we're talking about today. And we'll get back to that. Turn again with me to Genesis, and let's go to Genesis 25, Verse 29, Genesis 25, verse 29. Genesis 25, verse 29. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do me? And Jacob said, I swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright until Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drank and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau deprived his birthright. When Esau, coming home one day, faint and weary from the chase, asked for food that Jacob was preparing. The latter, with whom one thought was ever uppermost, seized with his advantage, and he offered his, his, to satisfy his brother's hunger at the price of the birthright. Behold, I am at the point to die, cried the reckless, indulgent hunter. Have you ever been that? If I don't eat, I'm going to die. If I don't have that whatever, I'm going to die. I'd die to eat that. And what profit shall this birthright do me unto me? And for a dish of red pottage, he parted with his birthright and confirmed the transaction by an oath. A short time at most would have secured him food in his father's tent. But to satisfy the desire of the moment, let me read that again. But to satisfy the desire of the moment, you ever just wanted that donut so bad? Boy, it really looks good. Or just, just one bite. 
the desire for the moment? He carelessly bartered the glorious heritage that God Himself had promised to His fathers. His whole interest was in the present. What's going on right now? He was ready to sacrifice the heavenly to the earthly to exchange a future good for a momentary uh, indulgence. Patriarchs and Prophets, 179, paragraph 1. Do you see consistency going on here? Eve, the children of Israel, Esau. And there is another story in the Old Testament. It's the story of Daniel and his three friends. What was the test that they had? It was the king's food. And what was their choice? Unlike Eve, unlike um, Esau, unlike some of those children of Israel, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego chose to follow God's commands and eat healthy and to refrain from a lustful appetite. Turn with me to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And we're going to be moving around a little bit, so get ready to go. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, what had just happened? He had just been baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost, and where did he go? Led by the Spirit to where? The wilderness. Now let's go to Mark chapter 1, verse 11. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Let's go to Luke. Dr. Luke. Luke chapter 4, verse 3. Luke chapter 4, verse 2. Being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. What was the temptation to Christ? Food. Appetite. Have you ever been just hungry? Have you ever done a fast? A long fast? And you see a piece of bread over there? Or maybe a banana over there that someone else might be around. Mm. Boy, it sure looks awful good. How strong is your willpower? With the terrible weight of sin of the world upon him, Christ withstood the test upon appetite, upon the love of the world, and upon that love of display which leads to presumption. These were the temptations that overcame Adam and Eve and that so readily overcome us. Daniel 1.16, paragraph 4. Now it's interesting it says Adam and Eve. Adam was responsible for Eve. Eve chose appetite. Adam did not. Av Adam chose love of his wife over Christ. But because Adam was in head of the home, the one in charge there, he then was charged with her sin. See, on the fire department, because I'm the chief, if someone does something out there in negligence, I can also be charged because they're under my command. I'm responsible for what they do. I'm responsible for their actions. I'm responsible for their training to make sure that they don't do something wrong. So like they 
are getting trouble, I also can be in trouble and charged with that same situation because I did not prevent it from happening. I went along with it, maybe, knowingly or unknowingly. But if Adam had said no and chose his love for Christ, he would not have been charged for that. With Christ, as with the holy pair in Eden, appetite was the ground of the first great temptation. Just where the ruin began, the work of our redemption must begin. As by the indulgence of appetite Adam fell, so by denial of appetite Christ must overcome. And it's interesting, Adam fell, not Eve fell. Adam was the one that was responsible, head of the house. He was being charged on her neglect. Adam was being charged. Christ had to overcome. Listen to this, Desire of Ages, page 117. But when Adam was assailed by the tempter, none of the effects of sin were upon him. It was perfect. There was no sin. He stood in the strength of perfect manhood, possessing the full vigor of mind and body. He was surrounded with the glories of Eden and was in daily communion with heavenly beings. It was not thus with Jesus when he entered in the wilderness to cope with Satan. For 4,000 years, the race had been decreasing in physical strength, in mental power, and in moral worth. And Christ took upon him, listen to this, folks. This may answer one of the questions you have. Listen up. Listen up. Christ took upon him the infirmities of degenerative humanity. Christ took upon him the infirmities of degenerative humanity. Thus, only thus could he res rescue man from the lowest depths of his degradation. Our Savior took humanity. That was De Desire of Ages 117, paragraph 1. Paragraph 2, our Savior took, hum took humanity with all its liabilities. He took the nature of man, not unfallen, but fallen, with the possibility of yielding to temptation. We have nothing to bear which he has not endured. There came to the Savior, as if an answer to his prayers, one in the guise of an angel from heaven. He claimed to have a commission from God de to declare that Christ's fast was at an end. As God has sent an angel to stay the hand of Abraham from offering Isaac, so satisfied with Christ's willingness to enter the blood-stained path, the Father had sent an angel to deliver him. This was the message brought to Jesus. The Savior was faint from hunger. He was craving for food. When Satan came suddenly upon him, pointing to the stones which strewed the desert and which had the appearance of loaves in the tempter. The tempter said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Could have Jesus turned them in the bread? Easy. Though he appeared as an angel of light, these first words de, uh, betray his character. If thou be the Son of God. Here is the insinuation of distrust. Should Jesus do what Satan suggests, it would be an acceptance of the doubt, the tempter's plans to overthrow Christ by the same means that were so successful with the human race in the beginning, Desire of Ages. Again, page 118, this is paragraph 2 and 3. Testimonies, volume 3, 561. Listen to this, y'all. Take note. Write this down. His most, Satan's, his most effective temptation today. His most effective temptation today. Satan comes to man as he came to Christ with his overpowering temptation to indulge appetite. He well knows his power to overcome man upon this subject. 
nor this point. He overcame Adam and Eve and Eden upon appetite, and they lost their blissful home. What accumulated misery and crime have filled our world in consequence of the fall of Adam? Entire cities have been blotted from the face of the earth. Entire cities have been blotted from the face of the earth because of the debasing crimes and revolting iniquities that made them a blot upon the universe. Indulgence of appetite was the foundation. Indulgence of appetite was the foundation of all their sins. Through appetite, through appetite, con Satan controlled the mind and being. Thousands who might have lived have prematurely passed to their graves, physical, mental, and moral wrecks. They have good powers, but they sacrifice all to indulgence of appetite, which led them to lay the reins upon the neck of lust. One day I got in my car and I was driving home. I was in North Carolina. And as I was turning the radio on, I was listening to a radio station out of Black Mountain, North Carolina. Billy Graham's radio station. That's what we had for a Christian radio station in that area. And I enjoyed listening to the, to the good music at that time. And there was an old Baptist minister that was on there. And he was preaching and it got my attention. So I listened to it as I drove home. And as I got to the house and pulled into the driveway, I sat in the car, turned off the engine, but left the radio on and listened to this old Baptist preacher preach. Here's what he said. He was talking about fasting, where the Bible talks about fasting, the benefits of fasting. There's physiological benefits, he said, but the most important benefit, he said, is the ability to say no. Was he correct? He was. I call it the no muscle. The no muscle. See, by fasting, you build the no muscle. When I do programs with people many times, we'll do a three-day fast, a five-day fast. I remember I was in Africa and this ambassador came through our program The morning of day three, he says, you know, I have really learned something. He said, I've never gone to bed hungry in my life. Never. I've never gone to bed hungry in my life. As I drive the streets here in Africa, I see people that are hungry. I had no understanding what it was to be hungry. And he says, I've only not eaten for three days. What must it feel what they're going through? He said, the other thing is at my house, a very nice home, he says, I could have at any time walked downstairs, walked over to this very nice kitchen, opened that refrigerator door and had whatever he wanted. He says, I've never... I've never been hungry. Those people on the side of the street, they're hungry and they don't have the refrigerator to go to. And I had it. Fasting builds the no muscle. See, we're told in inspiration, if you can say no to appetite, you can say no to any other temptation. If you can say no to Satan's ultimate weapon, you can say no to any other temptation. Have you ever fasted? You ever fasted one day? Two days? Three days? It's physiologically really good for you. Four days? Five days? I have a friend just fasted, I think, 21 days. 
I'm not saying we have to do a 40-day fast, a 21-day fast, but a three- and five-day fast are really beneficial. And, and my good friend, Dr. Agatha Thrash, she would tell folks, if you will fast one day a week, it is phenomenal what it does to you physiologically, not to mention what it does to the no muscle. Her, doctor, her husband, Dr. Calvin, he tried to talk you into fasting two days a week. He exalted that Adam and Eve in Eden could not resist his insinuations when he appealed to their appetite. The inhabitants of the old world he overcame in the same manner through the indulgence of lustful appetite and corrupt passions. Through the gratification of appetite, he had overthrown the Israelites. Isn't that something? Through the gratification of appetites, Satan overthrew the Israelites. Temperance, page 13, paragraph 4. 1T, 486, paragraph 3. In order to be fitted for translation, in order to be fitted for translation, do you want to be translated? The people of God must. It's kind of like, have you ever gone and taken courses and there's prerequisites? You can't take this course until you have this course, and you can't take this course until you have this course. You can't just jump right here. Prerequisites. Here's what it says. In order to be fitted for translation, God's people must know themselves. They must understand in regard to their own physical frames. They must understand their physiology. Very important. The brain is the organ and instrument of the mind. And we'll, through this series, you'll hear this quite often. It's so important. The brain is the organ and instrument of the mind and controls the whole body. In order for the other parts of the system to be healthy, the brain must be healthy. And in order for the brain to be healthy, the blood must be pure. If by correct habits of eating and drinking, the body is kept pure, the brain will be properly nourished. Now, in this series, we learn that the, the most important organ in the body is what? What is it? The most important organ in the body is what? The brain. Why is that? Because that is how we communicate to God. So the brain has to be healthy. How do we make the brain healthy? In order for the brain to be healthy, the, the blood must be pure. And how does that happen? If by correct habits of eating and drinking, the blood is kept pure, the brain will be properly nourished. So Satan knows if, you can t if he can make you have a Twinkie brain, if he can make you have a donut brain, if he can make you have a chicken brain, you cannot discern the Word of God as effectively. So what does he do? He takes out your brain with appetite. Do you see that? Our physical health is maintained by what we eat. If our appetites are not under the control of a sanctified mind, if we are not temperate in all our eating and drinking, we must not be in a state we shall not be in a state of mental and physical soundness to study the Word with a purpose to learn what saith the Scripture. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Again, Daniel 12, 1. It will be a time as never before. During pandemics, People get all scared and they're worried to death and whatever. That's nothing. Or as we see here in the South, that ain't nothing compared to what's about to happen in the future. 
I have seen people in pandemics just plumb scared to death. Can't hardly do a thing. That's nothing compared to what's coming. How do you control that? A relationship with Christ. A brain that's strong by correct eating and drinking, by controlling our appetite. Any unhealthful habit will produce an unhealthful condition in the system, and the delicate living machinery of the stomach will be injured and will not be able to do its work properly. Councils and Diet and Foods, 52.2. The diet has much to do with the disposition to enter into tempt uh, temptation and commit sin. Whoa, did you hear that? Councils and Diet and Foods, page 52, paragraph 2. The diet, what you choose to eat, how, what you choose on appetite, has much to do with the disposition to enter into temptation and commit sin. Did Satan's plan work? Through appetite, he was able to undermine humanity. Revere and Herald, April 16, 1901, paragraph 6. Through perverted appetite, the world would be made corrupt. Satan has constantly, Satan is constantly on the alert to bring the race fully under his control. Satan is constantly on the alert to bring the race fully under his control. Get this. Listen up, y'all. Underline this. Highlight this. His strongest hold on man. Satan's strongest hold on man. I'm reading for Councils and Diets, page 150, paragraph 1. Councils and Diet and Foods, 150, paragraph 1. The enemy, strongest hold on you and me is through the appetite. And this he seeks to stimulate in every possible way. Do you have control of your appetite? Do you have reins on your appetite? Do you have control of your children's appetite? Because let's put their name in here. Satan's strongest hold on Johnny and Susie is through the appetite. And this he seeks to stimulate in every possible way. But that's what Johnny wants. That's what Susie wants. They'll cry. They won't eat anything. I remember when I was a boy, we didn't have much, and I had a little dachshund. And she'd come to the table, and she'd want some food. And um, Dad would say, boy, we ain't got the food to be, the money to be feeding the dog. It's got his food over there, checkerboard by Perina. I said, but Dad, she won't eat it. She's hungry. He says, don't feed the dog, son. She'll get hungry enough. Well, I didn't need to be told again. Those of y'all my age know what would have happened if I had fed that dog again. My seat would have gotten hot or I might have missed a meal or two. They were serious back then. There was no counting. You know, Johnny, one, two, two and a half. Come on, Johnny, let's get it done. Two and three quarters? No, there was no counting in my family or my grandparents or my aunts and uncles. If you've been told, you were told or you had been told, you had better obey or there's consequences. God is the same way. There's consequences. And unfortunately, we're leading our children today to believe that God's saying one, two, two and a half, three, what was I needed to do? I'll, Johnny, you better do it. And you go away and you leave Johnny and Johnny does what he wants to do. Do we not see that today? And we're leading our children to believe that is how God will take care of it. And that is not how God takes care of things. If God says do it, he expects you to do it. There's consequences that we've just learned. Do it or die. So, honeybee, my dog, 
she got hungry and she started eating checkerboard. And I kept from getting whooping. I was shown that the work of health reform has scarcely been entered upon yet. While some feel deeply and act out their faith in the work, others remain indifferent and have scarcely taken the first step in reform. There seems to be in them a heart of unbelief, and as this reform restricts the lustful appetite, many shrink back and have other gods before the Lord. What are their gods? Their appetite. Now listen to this, y'all. This is scary. Their taste, their appetite is what? Their gods. So that's the other gods. Their taste, their appetite is their gods. The Twinkie your god, the, the Mountain Dew your god, the Dr. Pepper your god, the cheesecake your god. Or maybe it's too much of something good. Or maybe you're eating before going to bed. Their taste, their appetite is their God. And when the axe is laid at the root of the tree and those who have indulged their depraved appetites at the expense of health are touched, their sin pointed out, their idols shown them, their idols' appetite. They do not wish to be convinced. And although God's voice should speak directly to them to put away those health-destroying indulges, Indulgences, some would still cling to the hurtful things which they love. And even though God's voice would say to them, Sally, put that away. Don't eat that. John, don't eat that. If God had even said it. They seem joined to their idols, appetite. Listen up, y'all. Listen up. And God will soon say to his angels, let them go. Let them alone. Let them alone. Because, see, God is not a God that says, you do it, I'm going to make you do it. He gives you choices. And if you choose not to obey in appetite, and you choose other foods to be your God, He will tell your angels let him alone. We've got other folks to take care of. Do you want to be in that situation? I need as many angels as I can get to take care of me. So what do we do with this information? What do we do with this information we've learned tonight? What do we learn with history? Do you believe Satan will use appetite in the final days? It worked. It's worked all through history for 6,000 years. Absolutely he's going to use that. Can we prevent Satan from overcoming us through the gratification of appetite? Can we? Can you? Can you? Can you? Can you? Can you overcome appetite? Through Christ, you can. What examples do we have? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Christ. We can overcome through Christ. It's just your choice. Remember the guy at the pool of Bethesda? Jesus says, do you want to get better? Wilt thou be made whole? Do you want to get better? And many times, you know, you work with people who are smokers or drinkers. They have an addiction. You say, I don't understand it. Why don't they just stop those cigarettes? Why don't they just quit drinking? Look at what they're doing to their family. Appetite. The addiction to appetite is no different, y'all. It's actually Satan's ultimate weapon. More than addiction to alcohol and tobacco. Wow. That's serious. In conclusion... H.R. August 1, 1875, paragraph 16. As our first parents lost Eden through the indulgence of appetite, our only, our only hope of regaining Eden 
is through the firm denial of appetite and passion. Yes, passion's there too. As our parent, first parents lost Eden through the indulgence of appetite, our only hope of regaining Eden, going to heaven, regaining Eden here on earth, is through the firm denial of appetite and passion. If you don't get a handle on appetite and passion, you're not going. Why? You know it. You now know it. You're now held responsible. Abstemiousness in diet, that's temperance. That's, it's not moderation in all things, y'all. It's moderation in the good stuff and total abstinence in the bad stuff. Abstemiousness or temperance in diet and control of all the passions will preserve the intellect so that men may have mental and moral vigor to bring all their propensities under the control of the higher power through Christ and retain clearness of intellect to discern between right and wrong, between sacred and common things. Soon, we will see a time as never before. Satan himself will be walking on this earth and trying to persuade you. He took out Eve, who had no, no sin. We don't have a chance up against Satan without Christ. But it says here, we have to have a clearness of intellect to discern between right and wrong, between sacred and common things. And to do that, we have to control our appetite and our passions. Do you choose for you and your family to regain Eden? It's in your hands. What are you going to do with it? Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, it's so easy to say, oh, I got that. I can say no at any time. But we hear, we hear smokers say that. We, have, we hear alcoholics say that. But we know that the smoker has to put them cigarettes down. We know and not go back to them and not be in the presence of them. We know that alcoholics have to put that drink down and not go back to it. Appetite's harder. We got to eat. But Lord, teach us how to build that no muscle, as that old preacher said. Help us to learn from history how it took down the Garden of Eden, how it took down so many through history, the whole Jewish nation. Lord, first, give us a desire. Give us a desire to go, want to go to heaven and spend eternity with you so bad that we're willing to do anything, even saying no to appetite. It seems so simple, but it is extremely deadly. Lord, be with these folks around the world as they listen. Give them that desire. And oh, Lord, help us with our children and our grandchildren. Give us the wisdom and the guidance as parents and grandparents and how we can also help them Build the no muscle because we so want them in heaven too. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Join us next week for another sermon, live from Bolivia, and more Sabbath programming. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Amen.